professional and we're at a beach house. Um, oh, well, I guess if you have to be stranded, maybe that's not such a bad place to be stranded. I think it would be my number one choice. Oh, good. Well, <laughs> it's an ill wind that blows no one any good. Well said, well said. Thank you so much for doing this. Well, um, thank, you for, thank you for being patient. I know we've put you off for a long time. I uh, that couldn't be helped, that. but I'm very, I'm actually very happy to be doing this. And uh, I was, weirdly enough, I didn't expect it, but I was looking forward to it. Really? So, I wasn't sure what, how you would feel about it. Is there an element of trepidation or? Well, definitely there's an element of trepidation because I would say the most stressful experiences I've had in the last five years, apart from being in the epicenter of various demonstrations, were definitely interviews with people who were, uh, well, they ranged from mildly hostile to very hostile. And uh, those are tight ropes, you know, because if you make a mistake, well, it can be devastating and uh, devastating to your career, devastating to your family, devastating to your rep, your general reputation. So tight rope wall. I, I think most people watching you thought that, have thought that you are completely fearless, kind of cool as a cucumber, unfazed by any amount of attacks. Yeah, that's, that's wrong. That's wrong, okay. Oh yeah, that's, that's definitely wrong. Um, no, I've, I, I definitely found the interviews of all the things I did, as I said, apart from the demonstrations, you know, how, being, having your name, being cursed at and being chanted at by several hundred angry people is not anyone's idea of fun, especially if the attack continues afterwards, which happened on multiple occasions. And, oh, uh, yeah. but, but I don't think that was worse than the, the more hostile interviews. I, I really don't like upsetting people. That's um, interesting. Again, I think, I think that's, that's not something, something that people, people would imagine. imagine. Well, I am a clinical psychologist. It's not really, it's in my nature to help people, I would say. Um, you know, I, I, I have a hierarchy of, of b belief in some sense. I'm not going to say things I don't believe to be true to spare anyone's feelings. Although I would pick a truth that spared feelings the maximal allowable amount if I if I could do that so but um I'm not interested in generating controversy mostly I'm see it's a funny thing because I've learned over the years and this is again uh, in large part because I'm a clinical psychologist is that a little conflict in the present can save an awful lot of catastrophe later and people are very much likely to sidestep a problem in the hopes that it will go away. And I know that problems don't go away. They never go away. What they do is they multiply, they fester and multiply. And so I will have the fight now, knowing that it's inevitable later. And, and I mean, I always conducted myself that way within our family, as Michaela can attest to, both Tammy and I never allowed anything to sit unspoken under the rug. Mm -hmm. that, and so we'd have are uncomfortable conversations, but you know, I'd sweat my way through them. I don't enjoy them by any stretch of the imagination, but I can see the inevitable coming and, and I'm, I'm not going to allow that to happen without trying to make a difference. So. Do you think it's a, do you think it's a case that, there are, that the most people have the wrong impression of who you are or what you're like as a person? You know, no. I do play with people every week, week, and some, some people have a sense that their public image is absolutely accurate, accurate. and other people, people others feel that there are huge misapprehensions about who they are. Where do you sit on that? that? Okay, well, first, we have a bad audio situation, so you're oh. echoing, you're echoing a lot, so we, we should fix that, because we won't converse well if that no, happens. Okay. Well, I'll go ahead and answer the last question yeah. while we're waiting. Um, I feel... I believe that I'm misunderstood by the people who want to misunderstand me. Um, I think that by and large, that people have a good idea of who I am. Um, and by and large that that image is positive. In fact, it's positive to the point where I find it very difficult to believe. Um, I mean, for example, I just finished a podcast with Matthew McConaughey on Sunday. And you, the YouTube comments, there's about a million people have watched it already. 
And so that's something in and of itself. But the comments are unbelievably positive. Like they're, they're heartbreakingly positive. And the, and the like to dislike ratio is running about 99 to one. And that's, that's a little better than typical, but usually it's between 50 and 100, and 100 or 50 and 99 to one. Okay. And usually the YouTube comments are overwhelmingly positive. And that's certainly been the case while I've been ill and while my wife was ill. And so, um, you know, you might quibble and say that people have an impression of me that's too positive, but, but if I had to have a problem, that would be a good problem. I think that my reputation suffers among those for whom it's convenient to assume things about me that aren't the least bit true, like that I'm alt-right, for example, in my proclivities, either overtly or covertly, or that my followers are can be easily categorized in that manner. First, that I have followers. Second, that they can be categorized in that manner. And none of that's true. That Those aren't my political leanings. I'm not temperamentally inclined to, to any extreme viewpoint, and in fact, find them abhorrent. I've spent my whole life studying extreme political views um, since I was 18, essentially. And my listeners and viewers and readers are on YouTube, they're primarily male, but the, my book, 12 Rules for Life, just sold about between 4.5 and 5 million copies now. And it's not young, angry men who are buying that. And, and it, it, all you have to do is scroll through the YouTube comments on a popular video and you can see that. And almost none of the discussion is political. And when I did my tour for the book, it wasn't a political tour. It was, I'm a psychologist and I'm happy about that. I, I'm comfortable with that. And when I had to make a choice in my life between being political overtly and staying working as a psychologist, I've always chosen the latter. So that's tell me. That's way Anybody? better. Is yeah. that better? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. First thing yep. else right now, A, B, C, D. Is that all yep. working? It's better. Yeah. Yeah. Thank God for that. Thank yep, God. I'm really keep... sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. You know, there's bound to be the odd tech glitch. I guess that's true. I guess so. Um, just because I'm curious, as you're describing that kind of huge public response to you, it's a very shocking and strange thing to become a famous person, particularly yes. a famous person. Well, actually, I'm not. I'm not certain that it's the controversy that's been the most um, emotionally demanding. I what think it's. Your, yeah, go on. Well, I. I think I, I've had this incredible view into the suffering of thousands and thousands and thousands of people you know and I, I can't go out without people coming up to me Michaela can attest to this but every time I go out wherever I go people stop me and you know they have an instant deep conversation with me and they tell me that you know they're they tell me about well, first of all, they're usually somewhat shocked and then they're very polite. And then they tell me that they've been watching my YouTube videos or listening to the podcast or reading my book and that it's really helped them in some manner. And then they tell me a little bit about that and they're usually quite emotional. And um, it's... Uh, You don't have conversations like that that often outside of the clinical sphere, and you certainly don't have them repeatedly with strangers on the street. And but it, there's, some, there's something about it that's that's really remarkably positive. You know, um, when I walk around well in any city, in some sense, it's like I'm at home because where people know me, because people say on the street, they say, "Well." Uh, Really nice to see you out. I'm glad that your health is recovering. It's like being surrounded by, well, by well-wishers and by friends. And I'm happy about it because 
you know, it's, it's a great thing if you're a clinical psychologist to be able to extend your reach like that. But part of what's overwhelming to me is how it's direct evidence for how little encouragement so many people get. They're starving. Sorry, I haven't done an interview for a long time. Fine, take it, give me take one second. As long as you need, of course, of course, of course. Of course. He's okay, but he hasn't done an interview in a, in a long time. Totally understand. Totally, totally understand. No doubt at all. There, I've got an, got an exercise towel, so <laughs> that should do me through the interview. Um, Can I ask you a question? Did it feel, does it, do you carry this enormous sense of pressure of their expectations on you to be able to encourage them or guide them or, does that feel like a big pressure? Well, it feels like a big responsibility, and but I, I can't. It's an overwhelming responsibility, and it's very surprising. Like it's hard to, it's hard to believe. It's surreal. It's always surreal, and it's so universal. I mean, I was in Serbia for for months, not yes. so long ago, and it's the same there. It's the same everywhere. I've gone. If it's an airport or a cafe, or it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's everywhere in the world. I mean, I think I've looked at my view, YouTube views, and I think the, my YouTube videos, including the interviews, have been viewed at least 600 million times. And so it's a scale of exposure that's, well, I mean, it's not unparalleled because there are no shortage of famous people, but it's unparalleled. It's certainly unparalleled for me, um, but it's there's also this international element to it that's also new. You know, YouTube is a universal media platform, and it's so powerful that it's unbelievable. And if you put yourself in its clutches, then, well, most of the time, nothing will happen, but sometimes... There's a tremendous explosion. I mean, it's not surprising to me in some ways. You know, I knew when I was working on my first book, Maps of Meaning, that I was dealing with things that were fundamental. A lot, or I knew, I mean, I knew insofar as my sense of knowing is reliable, but generally it's been reliable. I, I can tell when I'm on to something. Um, and I knew I was dealing with things that were fundamental. And I watched the effect of my lectures when I was a university professor on my students. And most of the students who I taught said the most common response to my classes was that it changed their life. It changed the way they looked at everything. And that was my experience having learned and thought through the, what I learned and thought through when I wrote maps of meaning, it changed the way I looked at everything. So, I mean, I, and I could see this coming because as my reach expanded electronically, that sort of response continued to occur. But YouTube magnified that in a way that's, well, it, it, it's a lot to adapt to. You know, I mean, when all this hit me, I was already 55 or there or something, you know, and um, I'd labored under relative obscurity that that's been made more of than is really the case because my classes were always popular. And so I had a certain renown at the university as a teacher and I'd done some TV work for about 10 years really before I made the first couple of videos that went viral. Um, but I'd also set up the YouTube channel a couple of years before that. And it was accruing views, not at an exponentially growing rate, but you know, there were still tens of thousands of people watching and that's not trivial. So, but the response, you asked me about responsibility. I, I, I've certainly felt that when I have been ill over the last year, I mean, I thought it was one of the things that really kept me alive.
and I suppose it shaped my next book because I tried only to the the illnesses and the responsibility. I tried only to keep words that I found sustaining during that period of time. But part of the reason that I stayed alive was because I felt a overwhelming responsibility to all the people who had been, you know, affected by my work. I thought, well, that wouldn't go very well if I just expired somewhat melodramatically in the middle of Russia or in the middle of Serbia. And so it, it was responsibility, but also tremendous support. You know, it's quite something to be in despair and to have thousands of people wishing you well. And that's been my experience overall, is that the, the proportion of people who have been supportive to me and my family compared to the proportion of people who've been antagonistic, there's no comparison. The antagon It's not like the antagonism is trivial, and I don't, I, I, it hits me. I think it hits everyone in the family. I mean, Michaela's taken a lot of flack for squirreling me away in Russia and in Serbia and, you know, profiting from my corpse, so to speak. And that's been hard on her because like the rest of my family, well, she put a lot on the line to help me. And that is the case for many members of my family. But, you know, she, she was certainly the primary mover of all this from the public perspective and took a lot of flack for it. And that's been hard on her. But so the negative is salient, but the positive is overwhelming. And that was certainly, that was certainly the case on the tour, which was a delight in many ways, because it was so unbelievably positive. Well, there's thousands of people who were gathering together on a regular basis, different people in, in all these different cities who were there fundamentally because they wanted to get their lives together. You know, and the way that that was treated by the people that were antagonistic to me was was exactly what you'd predict in if you if you gave some credence to their cynicism. You know that it was a political ploy, or that I was exploiting people, or they they, they had no. And that would be mostly the radical identity politics types who, you know, who have no love lost for me, and and vice versa. It wasn't in their worldview that people could gather together like that because they wanted to improve. But that, that was the case. Of 2018. Um, by that point, obviously your life has kind of become unrecognizably huge and you're going on the book tour. To what extent was your mental health an issue for you during that year? I think you said to Joe Rogan that one of the worst days of your life was the day you spoke to Sam Harris. No, oh yeah, so Jesus God! That first discussion I had with Sam Harris. Oh man, yeah. I was just. Um, well, I don't think it's a mental health issue. Okay. I think it's a physical health issue. I have an autoimmune disorder of some sort, and it has multiple symptoms. One of the symptoms is depression, and you know it's not really a classic depression because. I don't I don't have the classic cognitive symptoms. I've never felt that my life wasn't worth living. I felt that I was in so much pain that I didn't know if I could continue to exist or that when I said so pain. Can you elaborate on that word pain? Because that can mean so many different things. Well, it would depend on on the particulars of the circumstances, I suppose, but depression is a pain like phenomenon. It it if you're depressed much of the cortical circuitry that mediates a pain response, like a physical pain response is activated. Many people with depression have pain syndromes, like lower back pain is very common among people who are depressed. So it is a pain symptom. It is a pain syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the, it's the, the depression I experienced, which is characteristic of, of many people in my family was grief like I would say it felt like overwhelming grief and it was worse in the morning and and uh, would recede during the day but it seemed to be part of a cluster of symptoms that were autoimmune in nature 
and much depression is autoimmune in nature. So I don't really, I think of it as, I think it's a physical illness as far as I can tell. When, when I talk to Sam Harris, um, it's very complicated and I'm, I'm still trying to piece all of this together, but I had gone to see my family, my extended family on my, on my wife's side and um, Michaela and her husband and me both, all of us came down with the same symptom set that lasted about three weeks and it was absolutely terrible. Um, I, I couldn't get up without fainting. I'd faint, fall to the floor, gray out, not black out completely, but gray out. Every time I got up, I couldn't get warm. I was wearing multiple layers of clothes and multiple layers of blankets and I couldn't get warm. Um, I had an overwhelming sense of, of doom and anxiety. Um, and I didn't want to move. And plus I couldn't sleep for, for days and days. I, I don't, I, I was without sleep for many weeks. And you know, and this people have. I have look. That's what that's. This is. It wasn't. No, hold on. There were no doubt. Hold up. Multiple. It wasn't apple cider. It was sodium okay. metabisulfite in apple cider. Um, like the alcoholic apple cider was added to a stew. I'm so sorry. it was sodium metabisulfite in that apple cider, but it wasn't apple cider. Right, I understand. Anyways, in the midst of that, um, which was, in the midst of that, I talked to Sam Harris and I was mm -hmm. operating at about 5% of my normal capacity, if that it was terrible. But, you know, it, I wasn't going to forego the opportunity because it was a necessary discussion. Now I was nowhere near it. I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't at my sharpest and you can certainly tell that in the interview. Uh, you know, I, I, I couldn't respond rapidly. Uh, my, my normal quickness of wit to what degree I possessed that was certainly absent in that first discussion with Sam, but it turned out that that was, it worked out all right because we had another discussion and overall, and you know, then I had these public debates with Sam too, that, that really, I think we had 10,000 people at the Orpheum in London. It would, it turned into something that neither of us would have possibly imagined. I don't know if there's ever, I don't know if there's ever been a larger public debate, or certainly not on that kind of issue, you know, and, and who would have known that that would become something that was so popular that it was what well, was somewhat of a cultural event. So I, I don't think it's unreasonable to, to claim that. And so you would prescribe the benzodiazepines as a result of that incident? Um, yes, absolutely. and a sleeping pill. By your family doctor, were you yes. at all worried? Did you did sort of alarm bells ring about women in the fifties and sixties who got hooked on Valium and couldn't get off it? And well, look, when when benzodiazepines were were first introduced, they were touted as a an almost completely safe replacement for barbiturates. I so no, I really didn't give it a second thought. What happened was, well, partly I was, I was, you know, my life was an absolute whirlwind at that, at that time. Um, so it, it fell, if, if it had been an item of concern, it fell, you know, to number 20 on a list of 20 and only 10, one through 10 ever got attended to. Um, you know, at the time that I had this terrible reaction, other things were happening. They, the Canadian um, equivalent of the IRS was after me and, and making my life miserable for something they admitted was a mistake three months later, but they were just torturing me to death. The college of psychologists that I belonged to was after me because one of my clients had put forth a, a, a whole sequence of specious allegations because the person was upset that I had sort of disappeared over the Christmas vacation. So that was extraordinarily stressful. Um, it wasn't clear to me whether my job was going to continue. Um, so, you know, there were other, there were other issues. <laughs> Plus I was at the epicenter of this incredible controversy and there were journalists around me constantly and students demonstrating and it, like, it was a very hectic time. Um, in any case, I took the benzodiazepines. I didn't take the sleeping pills. I think I took them two or three times and just stopped. But the benzodiazepines allowed me to sleep again. And mm -hmm. it was a very stressful time. And uh, I just, they were prescribed for two a day and I just took them. And it wasn't like I was, I, I couldn't feel them. They weren't 
they, I wasn't taking a high enough dose so that I could actually detect the effects of the, of the sedation. They weren't sedating me at all. They just stopped whatever had happened to me, which I still don't really understand. You know, we, we have a hypothesis that it was a reaction to allergic reaction to, to the chemical that Michaela described, but, but it was strange that all that the three of us were affected by it and no one else as well. Anyhow, well, that's, in any case, that's what Dave, that's what the psychiatrist said is that when you go off of SSRIs, you can be neurologically sensitive to chemicals. And yeah. So yeah. Well, like that's a reasonable that lines up. Yeah. And I was it's probably our theory. Like we did Fair enough, to a doctor. Yeah. yeah. That doesn't give it enough credit. Like there are doctors involved here. No, it's not like we were, no, yes, and many of them. It's not like we've been sitting around armchair hypothesizing about what happened. We've consulted many people to try to figure this out. Um, and you had by that point come off SSRIs because of the diet. Is that right? Because the efficacy of the diet. Yes. And the diet did a lot of different things, had a lot of different effects on me. Uh, uh, one of the most marked effects immediately was that I stopped snoring. And that, that happened within a week and was very, very surprising to me. And then I, I had psoriasis and that cleared up and um, I had gum it's disease and that, that cleared up, which is, that's not curable gum disease. So it's treatable, but not curable, but it's completely cleared up. And uh, I lost 70 pounds over about a seven month period. Mm -hmm. So it was, the, the transformation was remarkable. And I've had other autoimmune uh, symptoms in my life. I had alopecia areata at one point and thought I was going to lose all my hair, but luckily that re that stopped. And I had this condition called peripheral uveitis, which is an inflammation in the in the tissue of the eye, and uh, markers on my fingernails for autoimmune, like in an autoimmune condition, your body attacks its own cells, and I had markers for that as well. So there's a, and I have had a, a lengthy history of mouth ulcers. Um, that, and that but you've was, never been, but there's never been a formal diagnosis of the nature of the autoimmune disorder. Immune yeah, disorder there was you? twice in the last year. Oh. Okay. Um, in Russia and in Serbia, because they did blood tests. Dad. Oh, yep, I'm back. It's just um, camera just in, in Russia. It, it they never pinpointed what it was. In Russia, it was fibromyalgia, and in Serbia, mm -hmm. they thought fibromyalgia, but it was from blood markers and so they were going based on blood markers and symptoms and put fibromyalgia on it yeah and i mean these autoimmune conditions aren't very well understood and and fibromyalgia is a good example of that it's it's terra incognita um so the benzodiazepines seem to help sort of resolve that issue but you talked about how you I've read you talking about how you felt that it kind of muted somewhat your rela your relationships with people. Well, it was very confusing. It was a very confusing time, you know, because a lot of what was happening to me was also in some sense alienating me from, from myself and my family because it was so different from what had happened before. So trying to discriminate between the strange con and surreal conditions of my life and the effect of this drug. I never thought about the drug having any effect on me with regards to this muting and for quite a long time. And, uh, and while well, I also started to get kind of weak on my left side, and I, I kind of thought at that point that the benzodiazepine might've had something to do with it, but wasn't sure. It, and that thought would just come up now and then. And I complained about it, that I had a weak weakness in my in my musculature on the left side. But I never thought much of it. And I, I wasn't that worried. I wasn't thinking about the benzodiazepines like 10 hours a day or anything like that. I, I never thought about it at all. I was extraordinarily busy. 16 hours a day, flat out, seven days a week for, for well, right until Tammy went into the hospital. In, yeah. no, right until Michaela went into the hospital in January of... 2019 it 19, was yes. flat out running and so I wasn't sitting around thinking about what was happening with me and you know if I was a bit off well so was my life it wasn't exactly uh surprising that all of this might have had some effect on my relationships and that was kind of that was subtle anyways I, I mean we talked about it you know the kids would tell me that I was distant but <laughs> that's not a five alarm fire bell being somewhat distant, especially under, under strange circumstances. Um, 
including visiting 160 cities in 200 days. Jesus. And I was functioning, obviously. I mean, I gave a different lecture every night. Were you enjoying yourself? Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. It was amazing. And, and I don't think enjoying myself doesn't really cover it. It's, it, was, it was... The best year of your life? Dreamlike. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that. I've had some pretty good years. It was the it was it was surreal, but it was it was surreal in a way that was also see one of the markers for post traumatic post traumatic stress disorder is derealization, right? When the things around you don't seem real, and I was in a constant state of derealization from October two thousand and sixteen <laughs> October two thousand and sixteen till January twelfth of two thousand and twenty one. <laughs> Go on, explain. Well, I, I didn't, I still don't really have the, I, well, I'll give you an example. <laughs> so one day, and this would have been in 2017, probably, and so things hadn't got as busy as they were going to get. Mm -hmm. Um 200 of my colleagues signed a petition at the University of Toronto to have me removed from my tenured position. And my faculty association, so an association to which I belong, forwarded that to the administration without even notifying me. And my son came over to talk to me and I said, Julian, um, you know, 200 of my colleagues just signed a petition asking for my removal from the University of Toronto faculty. And he said, oh, dad, don't worry about that. It's only 200 people. And we had got to the point by that time where that sort of event was, well, produced exactly the kind of response he had. Like, under normal circumstances, I believe, for anyone who's employed by an organization, the news that 200 of their colleagues had conspired um, inappropriately to bring about their demise would be enough to rattle them for to rattle them into silence permanently instantly and for us that was barely noticeable as a blip on on the horizon given everything else that was going on and as it turned out it had absolutely no effect maybe a, a somewhat negative effect in terms of the reputation of the university but no effect on me so, no practical effect, but do you think it had a kind of residual effect? You're talking about derealization and PTSD that these kinds of well, all of this has. I, mean, I still really don't have a, a proper conceptual framework in which to slot all this. Yeah, um, it's it's not yeah. a, it's not an easy thing to understand. I don't know what to make of it. What do I? What should I make of the fact that I have 600 million views on YouTube? I don't know. I, what do you it's make of that? Dramatic. I don't. Know. I mean, on the one hand, like I said, I knew that I was dealing with things that were fundamental when I was writing Maps of Meaning, and I watched the effect of what I had learned on my students. And so that didn't, and that grew across time. It continued to grow in a linear fashion. And so, and it, in some sense, that's not that surprising because all the ideas in, in Maps of Meaning, which is really where I've derived most of the ideas or many of the ideas for my book, 12 Rules, and for the new one, um, you know, I, I studied people who, whose work I thought was profound and was able to integrate that and to disseminate it. And so the fact that profound thoughts had effects on people isn't that surprising. And I'm not saying that they were my thoughts because Maps of Meaning has a very lengthy bibliography and, and I use ideas that towering intellects had generated. Uh, many of them psychologists. And so the fact that they had a powerful psychological effect makes sense. It's, it's still something to be the messenger, even if you're not necessarily the originator. But so that part wasn't what wasn't a surprise in, in some ways, but the magnitude of the the magnitude of the response has been and the nature of the response, the emotional nature of the response has been continually amazing.
you know, then, when, when, when I was visiting Tammy in the hospital, well, and then, <laughs> you know, not only did all, did all of these things occur on the social front, you, you got to think about it this way. You know, I've watched people respond to being attacked on Twitter. So they'll post something or write a paper and 20 people will go after them on Twitter and that'll produce a bit of a storm. And they usually apologize profusely and back the hell off and disappear. It's really, really emotionally hard on people to be attacked publicly like that. And that happened to me continually for like three years and on a way larger scale than 20 people. You know, I mean, the, the, the even just the events at, at, um, um, Wilfrid Laurier University with Lindsay Shepard. Like was, that was the biggest scandal that hit a Canadian university, certainly in my lifetime. And that was just, that was a sideshow. And I'm, I'm not making light of it. it. It wasn't a trivial occurrence, but it was just one of dozens of things that were happening on a regular basis. The, the demonstration at Queen's University, when I, when I went there to talk with Bruce Party, a, a lawyer there, I mean, you know, we were, we were in a building with, 200, 250 students, 300 students, I don't know. And the protesters were outside at the windows, banging on the windows, breaking them in one case. It was completely surreal. It was like a zombie attack. Um, were you frightened by any of this? Was any of it frightening? I guess I'd have, to, yes, I would say definitely. I mean, yeah. I, I would, the most, the, the fright, I was never concerned for my, I wasn't concerned for my life. I wasn't concerned for my physical safety. Mm -hmm. I was concerned for my family. I was concerned for my reputation. I was concerned for, for my, my, my occupation, both as a clinical psychologist, because I was under attack at the college of psychologists as well as at the university. Um, so, and then there were times where I was physically threatened certainly that happened at queen's university they arrested a woman who was carrying a garrote for god's sake you know and and um i, I was harassed directly after the demonstration there by a you know a small coterie of of insane protesters um let's say committed protesters who were in my face for two blocks, three blocks, yelling and screaming with my, my son was with me. And, you know, the, the university security guards, they didn't know what to do. They weren't trained for that sort of thing. And I was very, I was, I wouldn't say I was so much afraid. There was very angry. Like I took everything I could not to knock the man who was in my face flat, but I wasn't going to do that. And uh, well, I mean, what, I was what, what, what he was doing. Mm -hmm. How did you, how did you, what was your demeanor while that was going on? Calm and watchful. I mean, one of the advantages I have had is that I am a clinical psychologist, you know, and I can detach myself from what's happening and watch it. And that's partly when I'm being interviewed by someone who's hostile and, and able to keep my cool. It's partly because I can watch. And also partly because I, I know that what's happening right now isn't the whole story. You know, it's especially true in the modern world with an interview. It's like, the interview can be very hostile and that by no means means that I'm under attack. It just no. feels like that in the moment. Like with, with the interview with, K with Kathy Newman, for example, on channel four, or there was another interview done by a, a woman who works for GQ, which I think has been viewed, yeah, it's been viewed 22 million times, I believe at the moment. So it's just, it's just under the Kathy Newman video in terms of number of viewers that was a very, very uh, animus possessed interview. She was on my case right from the moment I walked into the room, essentially. And um, presumably, you I, knew that would be the case. I mean, Helen Lewis is a very established feminist, professional feminist. Well, I didn't. I didn't know that it would be the case. Oh, I see. At that okay. time, I was being I was being interviewed so often that I never had any time to prepare for the interview. Understood. I just, Understood. I just walked into them, and I assumed I assumed at least that there would be, you know, common professional courtesy. And most of the time, that was the case. It was certainly the case with Kathy Newman, who was very professionally polite when we first met in the green room, and then, well, and then, why isn't, and then went on the attack, I suppose. Um, when she was interviewing me, but th both of those interviews, 
the tide turned, you know, and it was very, very strange with the Kathy Newman interview, because first of all, people were rather sympathetic to me. And then she reported um, being harassed, especially online. And then so the sympathy sort of moved over to her side of the equation, let's say. And then for one reason or another, it shifted back to me. Um, but do you think, but did you enjoy them in real time during those two hours with Helen nearly and half an hour with Kathy? No, you didn't enjoy a second of it. No. Oh, yes. With Kathy, I enjoyed a second of it. Which when, second? Well, when she stopped, when, when, when I see, there was one point where she was reduced to silence. And I'd asked her a very serious question, which was how, why she thought it was okay to go after me for making people uncomfortable with my opinions when it was okay for her to go after me and make me as uncomfortable as possible in this particular scenario. And she had no answer to that. And she had no answer to that because she knew perfectly well that she was being hypocritical. And she stumbled and, and stopped speaking. And I said, gotcha. And I enjoyed that. And I thought like in that half a second, I thought long and hard about whether or not I was going to say that. I knew it would be funny. And I do have a sense of humor, although it's rather suppressed it's been rather suppressed over the last couple of years. Um, yeah. And I took a calculated risk and I would say that I enjoyed that because it, the timing was right. And, um, and it, worked. it paid off, but it sounds as if but it was a risk, to... man. It could have easily gone badly. Right. You, it sounds as if you've withstood all kinds of pressures and stresses and navigated an extraordinary roller coaster and kind of kept it all together and handled it. Up until 2019, when your wife is in hospital and being given this devastating Well, news. 2019 was, you know, it was just, it, it started out rough. I, I, mean, I, went, I, I, yes, I went to Switzerland yeah. and, I was in, and I was in Switzerland with Michaela for, well, for a number of weeks when she was having her ankle rebuilt yeah. by, by carpenters. I mean, it was very dramatic surgery um and the outcome wasn't obvious she could have easily lost her leg and lots of people that she talked to suggested that that would be the case and so and it was strange to set up camp in zurich and and to bring her food and and to take care of her and then we went to australia for a whirlwind tour in february and that went quite nicely and then well things just things just fell apart insanely with tammy you know it was just every bloody day was a life and death crisis for like five months and initially we were informed that her illness was highly treatable and minor and you know just in in a typical cliched movie scene we went to see the doctor after she had had her surgery but wasn't recovering quite properly and they said well she's contracted this cancer that's so rare there's virtually no literature on it and the one-year fatality rate was a hundred percent and that was just the beginning of you know, endless nights sleeping on the floor in emergency and continual surgical complications and, and so, and then, and then, you know, my mood was, was wavering at that point. Um, I was taking a bit more of the benzodiazepine under still being supervised by my, my GP, but I started to react to it in a paradoxical manner, it seemed to be making me more anxious rather than less. And I tried various, and I, my depression seemed to be making a comeback. So I tried various means of dealing with that, but it just got worse and worse. And at one point I stopped taking the benzodiazepine altogether. And that- What well, happened when you did that? I developed this condition called akathisia, which I didn't That's know about at the point. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, and let me tell you, um, you wouldn't wish that on it's unbearable to say the least and you know they say with akathisia people are driven to suicidality within an hour of, of the onset of the symptoms i had akathisia for 800 hours 900 hours thousand hours sometimes seven hours a day wow unbelievable what did it feel like dr peterson well imagine that so imagine 
I just figured this out a way to communicate it proper to some degree properly in the last couple of days. So imagine that someone jabbed you really hard in the ribs with their fingers and stiff fingers, you know, you'd kind of, you'd pull away and then there'd be a spasm from that and you'd move. Well, then imagine that that's happening 50 times. And every time you breathe, that's, that's sort of what it's like. That level of physical pain and discomfort. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't go away. It's just there and it's there and it's there and it's there. And every time you breathe, it's there. You can't sit. And, you know, I couldn't sit down. I've been able to start sitting down again in the last month. So you and I could not have had a conversation like this where we're just talking to each other. And, uh... I might have been able to do it. Um, it would recede to some degree as the day went on. It was way worse in the morning and would get better in the evening. Mm -hmm. um, so it would have depended on the time of day, but certainly even now, you know, I really don't get going until two o'clock or so in the afternoon. Right. I'm my, my morning schedule is still very, very rigid, but it's, 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 uh, it's, it, yes, it's, un, it's unbearable, the sensation. And it's also humiliating because it's a voluntary movement disorder. Wow. And so what that means is that it feels like you're doing it. it and I could also control it. So if it was happening and I was twisting and, and moving and walking around in my bedroom uncontrollably thousands and thousands of times, if one of the people who were caring for me, a nurse or a doctor said, well, can you stop it? I could, I could stop it. It's Although not, I had a hard time stopping the effect of the breathing. It's not voluntary. One of the symptoms of akathisia is that it feels voluntary. This is in mm -hmm. akathisia. So one of the torturous things about it is it feels voluntary. There are other like psych side effects. Well, and you can control, it you can stop it at voluntary. least briefly. Well, yeah, there's a disorder called dyskinesia where you move, but you don't, you don't even know you're moving. It's so it's, it it's an uncontrollable movement disorder, but it's involuntary. It doesn't affect the voluntary motor system, but akathisia does. And so there's always this sense that you could stop it if you just exercised enough willpower. So it's humiliating as well. And does that also generate a kind of self-punishing dynamic in your head that you're angry with yourself? Disgusted, I would say, more than angry. Disgusted. Well, you feel as if you're being kind of grotesque and ridiculous and weak, is it? Or yes, definitely. It's not only that you feel like you're being that; it's it's that is the situation, or that's certainly how it appears. A grotesque, for sure. And did you feel incredibly self-conscious about it? And being oh no, seen? after a while, I just like <laughs> being self-conscious. It was so awful that being self, the problem of being self-conscious fell way down the the. Uh, like if you're in enough pain, you're no longer self-conscious. It's there, but it's, I shouldn't say that. You're still self-conscious, but the, that problem is so, it's trivial compared to the pain. Ah, it was horrible. I mean, I'm, that's the other thing that's so strange about this. And, and that's also made this surreal is that I'm actually a very private person. But prior to all this, I never discussed my own personal affairs with anyone. I never talk about my illness. I don't talk about how I'm doing. I have done that with depression to some degree because I thought there was a public service element in it, you know, because our my family has battled it for a very long time. And I felt that some public disclosure of that would perform a reasonable public health uh, function. But other than that, I'm not inclined towards personal self disclosure, and certainly not on a mass scale. So that's also been very strange to have all of this be so public over the last two years. I, and, and saying that, you know, brings up a wave of disbelief that that can be the case, that that's is actually it also panic? Is it, is it a panicky wave? Or is it just incredulity? At now, I think it's mostly just incredulity. <laughs> So you obviously tried to get treated twice in the, in North America, first in the Eastern Seaboard, yeah, and that then was, in that Toronto. Yeah, that just didn't work at all. Mm -hmm. Do you even remember much about those two? To, I those don't remember two. anything about Toronto. Uh, there's a, I don't Nothing remember anything. Toronto. From December 16th to February 5th I don't of, of 2020, the end of 2019, the beginning of 2020, I don't remember anything at all. 
Do you think you even did you know that you were being that you were flying to Moscow to be put oh, yes. into a coma? Yeah, yeah. So in real time you were fully aware of it, but you've got no memory of it now. That's right. Yeah. I mean, obviously, what lots of people would say is, why this is obviously I've talked to various people about this, and everyone says, why on earth? Would a high-profile North American... I went to the best treatment clinic in North America, in Connecticut, and all they did was make it worse. There were, we were out of options. Like, it, we were out of options. My, the, the judgment of my family was that I was likely going to die in Toronto. And so you there was no... die in Toronto. Again, I mean, lots of people would say, why would you sort of trust the judgment, although your family members love you, they're not trained, qualified medics... Why would you t- why would you put yourself in their hands and not the medical profession's hands? I had put myself in the hands of the medical profession. And the consequence of that was that I was going to die. And there were we put ourselves in the hands of medical professionals in Russia too. So it wasn't like we were fleeing completely fleeing from the medical profession. I tried a slow taper on the benzodiazepines and I couldn't do it. Yeah, you know, and I went to this the treatment clinic in in on the Eastern Seaboard, and they had promised essentially um, a twelve week treatment program, and my impression of that was that at the end of that twelve week period, I would be free of benzodiazepines, mm-hmm. but that isn't how it worked out at all. And I was I was on more medication when I left that treatment center than I was when I went in. Were you angry with them? Were you arguing with them? No. Why not? There was no point in in being angry. It was, wouldn't be helpful. I was disappointed. I mean, when I when I went when I went there to begin with, uh, right at in, ad, admission, they basically told me that the, the twelve week program was unlikely to be successful. And I thought, well, this is a hell of a time to be informing me of that since I've just come down from Toronto. But by that time, I was, well, there wasn't any alternatives at that point. So, you know, I was in, I was in a sufficiently dire state so that it wasn't tenable for me to maintain my residence. The clinic who... The clinic you went to in Moscow, they're more, they're more familiar with doing a kind of induced coma to have a sort of a, a, a speedy withdrawal from opiates rather than benzodiazepines. Is that right? Uh, Michaela would probably be better able to answer that than me. No, you're back. I suppose, again, one of the things that people absolutely associate you with is that you are meticulous about following the data you know it's almost a kind of Peterson catchphrase there's no evidence for that you know you are very much an evidence-based person what was the evidence that you saw that was so compelling and overwhelming to take you to Moscow I couldn't do the the um I couldn't do the I couldn't tolerate the uh the gradual taper so it was the only other alternative that's all it wasn't that it was compelling, it was that we were out of options. Right. Yeah, yeah the treatment I received in, in, on the eastern coast and in Toronto didn't help, it made it worse. Yeah. So we didn't have any other options. What were you most frightened of at that point? I know Michaela's talked about your kind of your anxiety that's easy. levels. I was, yeah. I was most afraid of akathisia. Like, right. I, there isn't anything else that, like, every day I had akathisia was the worst day of my life by a huge margin not by some trivial amount, but by a huge margin. It was absolutely unbearable. I, I mean, I tried to describe it. Uh, it. It's very difficult to describe. It's like pain, but it's a pain that, that you can't, that only movement will satisfy. I mean, even now I'm walking 10 miles a day. Yes, yes, I heard. Yeah, so. I mean, obviously, look, the obvious thing that critics, your enemies would say, I'm sure you, yeah, this is hardly going to be news to you, would be, hold on a minute, you know, you've, your entire intellectual framework, your philosophy of life is that life is about suffering, oh. and about pain, and yeah. that the manly, strong, dignified thing to do is to accept that pain and suffering and battle through it and learn from it, and that the coward's way out is to try and take drugs to... to um, to, no, I've uh, never said that. I'm, I've okay. never said that. And as a clinician, I mean, um, 
I've had many people in my practice look if you're a if you're a viable clinician you encourage people to take psychiatric medication when it's appropriate and many people in my practice were helped to a tremendous degree by antidepressants I was they were they were unbelievably helpful to me and to my and to other members of my family not universally and not without a cost but but very very helpful and you know that's a caricatured viewpoint too what what I really encourage people to what I what I encourage in people is the um, it isn't useful to allow your suffering to make you resentful even though you have many you have reason for that and so part of the battle it's a ridiculous caricature that that perspective you know life people people are hurt badly by their lives in all sorts of ways and becoming bitter and resentful about that means that you start to cause extra suffering in yourself and in your family members and in your community and that's not helpful it's not helpful and believe me i mean i've i've had plenty of temptation to become resentful about what's happened to me in the last two years with my wife's terrible illness and well with my daughter's illness first of all and then with my wife's illness and then with mine you know and and i've certainly had my moments where i thought it was torturous because it was unbelievably torturous because i was in agony and and with with an indeterminate uh prognosis but certainly one that indicated that this would last for months and months and only slowly recede months and months and perhaps years um i was shut off from my family except for well, for much of this time and among strangers who didn't speak my language mm -hmm. um and at the same time i was I had this plethora of opportunities sitting in front of me, none of which I was able to access. Like I love my wife and my... my kids and my grandkids. And it, it, was, it, was, it was like a, a nightmarish surrealist novel. I had all this waiting for me, all this life I put together so carefully. And it was constantly dangled out of my reach. I was co completely consciously aware of that. The condition I, I developed made it impossible for me to live at home. So I was divorced from, from my profession, from all the things that I was working on, and from everybody that I loved. I had plenty of reason to become, like many people do, to become bitter. It's not helpful. When I watched the podcast that you did with Michaela, I thought you looked angry at moments, and I was wondering who, who or what you were angry with. Well, pain will make you angry. Right. You know, so... Fate, I suppose. It was... I mean, I would say... Well, we've had our health troubles in our family for the last few years many years and the last two years were surreal in that regard again it was just too much and so I was never or very rarely angry when I was in the hospitals never angry at the nurses or doctors or very rarely is there any bit of you that's angry with yourself for taking benzodiazepines when now that you know how dangerous they are? Uh, angry. I wouldn't say angry. Um, I, I, it's not like I failed to see the irony. And that was another thing about this that made it quite, still continues to make it difficult to stomach. You know, I could, should have I known better? Possibly. Well, I mean, I did do my thesis on alcoholism, although, you know, this is, uh, hold, I, up, hold up. <laughs> yeah. You had a side effect from a medication. Should you have known better that benzodiazepines can cause akathisia in people who take SSRIs? 
No. You didn't have it like this. It turned, this wasn't benzodiazepine dependency problem. This was an akathisia side effect from psych meds. Right. So like, let's yes, and no, I couldn't have known that. Yes, that's right. Um, Thank you. I, I have to say we have 10 minutes before we have to wrap up. Yeah, I'm doing so, okay, by the way. Yeah, yeah, I know. But still, or mom will kill me. <laughs> So, Decca, what else do you want to talk about? I was curious about whether you, as a sort of art Soviet critic, whether the irony was also not lost on you that about ending up in Russia and really kind of um, to have your life saved. How do you make sense of that? Does that just seem like one of the bizarre coincidences of life? Yes, it's it's no. I don't know how to make sense of that. I don't know how to make sense of the fact that Tammy recovered the day of our thirtieth wedding anniversary, mm -hmm. which is literally the case. The surgical complications that were threatening her life ended on that day. And she had told me a few months earlier that she would recover on our 30th wedding anniversary. It's like, I don't know how to make sense out of that. It was, it was, yeah, I don't know what to, what to, what to think about that. There's lots of things I don't know what to think about. This the diet too has been a complete shock. So and that's maintained, been maintained throughout this whole process. The do, the hospitals were all willing to feed you your diet. Is that right? Well, I don't know how willing they were, but but um, that's what happened. That's what happened. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sure some people reading this are going to say this is all kind of pharmacological flim flam. What we surely to God, it's much less complicated than all of this. Why? You know, we have someone with a history of a history of depression who's lived through extraordinarily stressful, surreal, as you say, few years managing un unimaginable pressures and demands and pace of life. And this has got nothing to do with medicine or pharma pharmaceuticals. This is purely just about somebody cracking under the pressure of life. Is that a possibility that you've considered? Well, it's there's no doubt that... It's is then. That's right. That, well, that's the basic answer to that, is that like, I didn't develop akathisia until I stopped taking, tried to stop taking the, the benzodiazepines. So mm -hmm. now, whether the... I don't know, I can't say what additional effect the pressure had on making me more susceptible to akathisia, for example. I, I don't think anybody could answer that. And I certainly know that stress makes it worse, but stress makes everything worse. So that's not that helpful. Um, What's causing you the greatest stress now? Fear that the akathisia will come back. Right. I mean, I, I've had it now? five days. Well, in the last 43 days, I've had, in November, I had 26 akathisic days out of 31. Right. And those would last, those episodes would last anywhere from five to seven hours. Right. So that was just horrific. Um, in December, I had five days I was akathisic. Right. Only. And in January, so far, none, although it's still lurking there i can feel the, can the feel impulse it. yeah but i can keep it under control <laughs> or it's a, or it's not intense enough to overwhelm me i don't want to claim um i don't want to make any unwarranted moral claims about the effect of my will it certainly seems that i am effortly suppressing the desire to move constantly almost constantly but that's starting to recede, and the mornings are still very, very, very difficult. But when you say difficult, you mean difficult to get started, difficult to kind of get your brain into gear. Well, I get up and and I start breakfast, and then I go and I have a sauna for an hour and a half, and then I I'm in the shower and I scrub myself for about twenty minutes, and I I usually can hardly stand up at that point, and then I eat, and by the time I start to eat, then I'm I'm starting to be I can walk with at a somewhat normal pace by then and then I usually walk for anywhere between two and four hours and and then I can have I, I'm beginning to have a, something resembling a productive day my cognition is sharp enough now again so that I can well engage in an interview like this for example or I've been increasingly um 
participating in podcasts and that's probably yeah. that's been the other thing that's so difficult is my life was so bloody complicated that when it when I stopped my occupational activities it, it was very very difficult to start them up again because it's like jumping into a car that's going 900 miles an hour you know I did a podcast with Matthew McConaughey on, on December 22nd I think and it was released yesterday and something on the order of a million people 1.2 million people I think have watched it by now it's I'm to jump back into my life is to jump back into that there's no simple entry point and so that's been a real problem uh, I, I I I haven't known what to do the other thing that happened to me that was terrible in in 2020 is that I had this terrible uh experience of time dilation so when I first woke up in Russia I was asking Michaela when she'd come and visit me I'd ask her what time it was 10 times in 10 minutes assuming that something on the order of half an hour or an hour had gone by since the last time I asked her and so I had these torturous days that were like a hundred times longer than they should have been so that's receded and now I my days are there they last the proper amount of time last the of time. Are you yes a- thank god how are you feeling about the prospect of the book coming out and all the demands that that entails and the opportunities that that entails did well, I'm, cons- I'm, I'm ambivalent about it because I'm ambivalent. I'm ambivalent about it. I can't judge the book properly. I didn't write it under optimal circumstances, to say the least. And so I'm unsure. I can't tell. I can't make an adequate judgment of its quality. I know, I believe that my capacity for editing wasn't what it could be. Yeah, but that was offset to some degree by the fact that I was able to filter what I was writing through the lens of my illness and to eradicate everything that wasn't sustaining for me while I was in such trouble. So it's amazing to me that you were able to work on the book during that whole year. If you would have, if you would have seen me, believe me, it would have been more amazing. When I recorded the book, the audio book in in um, November. I was akathisic almost the entire time. And so 26 days in November, right? So I would, I would go to, well, I would go to the studio virtually convulsing in the car, like unable to control my movements, unable to control my arms, unable to control my legs, thrashing about. And, and Tammy would drive me there or, or my son. Some, and then the same thing would happen in the lobby. I, I, I was moving just frenetically. And then I'd go to get upstairs into the studio and force myself to sit down and then force myself to not move for two hours and do the recording. It was I, I was, if you would have asked me to lay odds on the probability that, well, that I would live to finish the recording, I would have bet you 10 to one that I wouldn't have, but certainly as well that I wouldn't have been able to do the recording, but I did the recording. So it's done. And it was the same with the book. I mean, I have, I've had lots of support, you know, my family has supported me tremendously and, and the professional staff that I've had the fortune to employ have helped me and my viewers have supported me and all of that's helped a lot. And so, but and on those five days in December, I can tell you why I did it, how oh. I could do it. It was easy. The alternative was worse. You know, if I would have lost the book, I wouldn't have had anything left. No job, no no function. You know, and I'm a I like to work. And I've always tried to be it's like a game in some sense. I've always tried to be as productive as possible on as many fronts as possible simultaneously. And I've practiced that since I was in graduate school. And it, it's a game, a constant challenge. And, you know, I first lost contact with my professional life, well, probably when I went on the tour, but the tour, of course, filled in that gap. But then when I, I spent all my time in 2019 in the hospital with Tammy, and that disrupted my professional life completely. And then I got so sick, I couldn't get it going again. And so that was... was two years. Mm, but But I had the book. And so I... You know, I'd get to the point where I could sit a bit at by three o'clock and I'd think, okay, I'm gonna sit and write. And it was it was hellish, but the the thought that I'd stop and 
and that would fold up and I'd have nothing. That was worse. And so, you know, if you're caught between the devil and the deep blue sea, at least you have your choice of demise. And so I, it was better to work than to not work. And that, that's definitely the case. So that's why that's to fine. the degree that I can explain how I was able to manage it. I'm not going to talk about willpower or courage. I'm going to talk about the lesser of two evils. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, we've only got a second. Uh, yeah, actually, let me ask you one question, then I just wanted to ask you a little bit about recent news events. Um, if you could turn back the clock five years, what would you do differently? I wouldn't take benzodiazepines. Are you angry with the doctor who prescribed them to you, who knew that you had also already done 15 years on SSRIs? No. Look, um, he, he, he served... He was my, my daughter's physician as well, and he was very helpful to us for a large part of her trouble. And so it would have... No, I'm not angry with him. This I, maybe he should have known better, but maybe I should have known better too. And like, you know, he, he also... It wasn't like I was consulting him every month. There was no reason... There was no reason to, to raise red flags. I was on a relatively moderate dose of benzodiazepine. And that's, it's not like that's rare. It's unbelievably common. Now, it's not good. As it turns out, the FDA put out warnings last fall, you know, stating quite clearly that these drugs shouldn't be used for more than 10 days. But the FDA didn't drive that message home until last fall. So those are the breaks, you know, and, and, I'm not happy, and I don't see how he could have, no, I don't harbor any resentment towards him. And just before we finish, can I just ask you a quick question about recent news events? I'm sure, sure go right ahead. you've been as kind of gripped as the rest of us by events in Washington in the last couple of weeks. Um, do you, obviously lots of people are now saying, Actually, I've, changed, I've revised my opinion about Trump. I didn't think he was dangerous. I didn't think he was... And you had certainly said quite calmly that you've called him a liberal and a moderate, no more of a demagogue than Reagan. Um, do you still feel that, or have you similarly changed your view about him? Well, I'm not, I'm not really... When I'm looking at what's happening in the United States in the last week, I'm not really thinking about it in terms of Trump. I'm thinking about it in terms of a positive feedback loop that's developed between the radical left and the radical right. And that, that's something that I saw coming five years ago. And you can put it out at Trump's feet, but it's not helpful. I mean, obviously, he was the immediate catalyst for the horrible events that enveloped Washington, the inexcusable events that enveloped Washington. And perhaps it'll all die down when Trump disappears, but I doubt it. And what I see, what's happening is there's a feud going on. And the feud is between the radicals on both sides of the political distribution. And the left will do something extreme and the right reacts and the right will do something extreme and the left reacts and the left blames the right and the right blames the left and that's a feud. And they're both right. They can both point to incalculably stupid things that their, their opposites across the political spectrum have engaged in. The danger is that we won't be able to dampen this down. Now, if Biden is wise, and I'm hoping that he is, he'll dampen the positive feedback loop down. A system is in a positive feedback loop when it amplifies its own behavior. And that's what's happening. And that can easily get out of control. Should and Biden, Biden now has sufficient political power so that he could emerge on the world stage as a genuinely moderate Democrat. He could leave the identity politics behind and rule in a Clinton-esque fashion. And that would be good. And we'll see. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping he can manage that. But the, the American political situation is, it's a robust country and it's been through worse. But there's always the danger that things can spiral out of hand. Are you more worried now than you were five years ago, four years ago? No, I'm not actually. I think that all things considered, 
2020 could have been a hell of a lot worse politically, given the fact that there is a simultaneous pandemic. People are under an awful lot of stress, everyone. They're too isolated. They're, they're cut off from their family members. They're under unbelievable economic strain. And they're also susceptible to the paranoia-inducing influence of the bubbles that have emerged on social media. And then those are the, the, that, that technology is exacerbating people's conspiratorial mindsets because they can find like-minded people and don't encounter correction. It's not good. But having said all that, we're not doing too badly. You know, if we're lucky, the vaccinations will proceed apace. We'll start to see a real decrease in the intensity of the epidemic by the end of March or the beginning of April. It's not that far away. It'll be mostly, the vaccinations will be universally accessible by September. And Biden will have proved to be intelligently moderate and cautious and we'll squeak through this. Now, that's, that's the most likely outcome as far as I'm concerned, and it's certainly the one that I'm hoping for. So, you know, my, my, my objections to the identity politics types were elicited in large part because I thought that the continual pushing on the radical leftist front would wake up the sleeping right. And so it came to pass. Well, we'll see. You know, I, I'm not going to say that that was accurate. Um, I don't know how awake the sleeping right is. You know, and what happened in Washington was appalling. But it was also stupidly appalling, thank God. You know, there was an element of farcical theater about it. And, and so that's a relief in some sense. Like, it's much better to see stupidity than malevolence, than organized malevolence. And I'm not saying there was no organized malevolence. There certainly was. But there was plenty of theatrical stupidity. And Trump is definitely egging that on. You know, and, and, and he's divisive in that, very divisive that, in that should, manner. Should he be impeached for that? I think he should be ignored. That the best thing that could happen is that he would fade away. <laughs> and impeachment will... Amplify. Well, I'm not claiming to be omniscient in these matters, but yes, I think that impeachment will just, it's, God, he's gone. Whoop. Hang on a sec. He's gone in a week. And the Democrats could busy themselves with getting the goddamn vaccinations out. You know, Biden's, Biden could be a successful president instantly if he did nothing else but vaccinate 100 million people in the next three months. And there isn't yep. anything that's anywhere near as important as that. And I'm hoping that what happened with Trump and his, his incitation, his inciting to, to, to um, protest, I'm hoping that'll fade away and that wise people will allow it to do exactly that. I don't think stoking the flames is a good idea. I've never thought that. That's what's... I can... From my perspective, I could see what was coming. Too much, too much ideological nonsense, too much identity politics. That's why Trump was elected to begin with. The Democrats alienated their, their working class voter base. They sacrificed the, their typical, the people that they had stood for, for for decades on the altar of identity politics. And I know why that is too. The Democrats don't have any policy making procedure. It's not part of the political, a part of the political system, and so what that means is the the radicals who have a narrative control the rudder because they have a narrative, and the centrists don't, and this is absolutely clear. I've been to Washington many times now and watched it. So the centrists need a story, and there is a story. The story would be peace and prosperity for all of us, low cost energy, you know, an economic an economic program that would that would that would benefit everyone, but maybe even most particularly the poor, because inequality is a real problem. Inequality destabilizes societies. It's clear. And so if you're a right winger or a left winger, you have your reasons to control inequality. If you're a right winger, you control inequality because you don't want your society to spiral out of control. And if you're a left winger, you control inequality because it's unfair that the people at the bottom are suffering the way they are, the ones that stack up at zero. 
It's, a, it's an unbelievably deep problem, and cheap ideological solutions aren't going to solve it. You know, inequality isn't a function of capitalism. It's, it's not, there's no evidence for that whatsoever. And so the, the continual attempts of the radical leftists to blame inequality on capitalism are self-defeating. And, and if, 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 if you were, I was talking to um, Matt Ridley the other day, he wrote The Rational Optimist, a number of other books, you know, and one of the things you might derive from Matt's books is that if you were truly concerned with the poor and with the environment, you would do everything you could to make the poor as rich as possible, as fast as you possibly could, because rich people care about the environment. And the fastest way to lift rich, poor people out of poverty is through free market capitalism, clearly. And the evidence for that is quite pronounced. Since the Soviet Union collapsed, more people have been lifted out of poverty than in the entire course of human history before that. From 2000 to 2010, ha the number of people who were in absolute poverty in the world fell by half. The Chinese just announced its eradication last week. And by 2030, the UN predicts that there'll be no absolute poverty anywhere in the world. So there are alternatives to this terrible ideological idiocy that's, that's threatening the stability of, of that's, threatening the, the, that's threatening stability in places like the United States. Anyways, look, I have faith in, in Western democratic institutions and the Americans have been through all sorts of upheavals in the past and come through with flying colors. And I think the same thing will happen now. I pray that Biden keeps the radicals in his party under control. He has the mandate to do that. He was a moderate, he was elected as such. And there's plenty of moderates in the Democrat in the Democratic Party that he could rely on. He doesn't have to pander to the radicals. And I've seen some evidence of that pandering already. It's very unfortunate. You look at that exactly like we should wrap this up. Yes. Otherwise, I, I, I'm just going to wonder why we've been doing this for an hour and forty minutes. Okay. Okay. okay you I said mean, I look exactly like. You do. I mean, listening to you speak, then that fact that that you would be eminently recognizable to anyone who's ever followed you or read you, or I suppose just before that. I'm curious. Do you think what what in any if in any way do you think the experience of the last year has changed you as a person? I have far more appreciation for the banality of the normal. You have no idea what a privilege it is to be able to sit down. On that note. <laughs> Thank you. I have to shut Thank it down. You so so look, before we before we stop, Michaela, we should think about this. Decca, you should think about whether you got everything you wanted. I mean, I want this interview to be I want you to be satisfied with this interview. And uh it's in it's obviously in my interest as well as yours that you're satisfied with this interview. And so if you have other questions, if you think there are things that we haven't talked about, if you think there are lacunae in, in our conversation, then let us know, okay? Brilliant. And we'll make arrangements to talk to you again. Fantastic. Thank you. I really, really appreciate this, all of you. Thank you. Yeah, no, I guess I, I'm, I have one other one question for you, too. <laughs> I think of all the things, I think it would be a mistake to tilt this discussion too much towards the details of my illness because the story the story here that hasn't been told properly is the reason for the tremendous hunger that's manifested itself for the sorts of things that I've been talking about and there isn't a journalist who's got that right yet and I think that's because journalists tend to look at things from a political perspective and this hasn't been a fundamentally political um, what I've been doing hasn't been fundamentally political, even though it's been cast that way. You know, I've been trying to help people. I've been trying to point out to people that they need a profound meaning in their life because their lives are difficult. And, and without a sustaining meaning, then you can become bitter. And that's a bad outcome. 
and also that the meaning that you need to sustain yourself is to be found through responsibility. And that's the fundamental, that's the fundamental message that's resounded with people. It's that small equation. Meaning justifies suffering and meaning is to be found through responsibility. And no one, no one is, no one is delivering that message, but it's, it's, it's not optional, that knowledge. It's vital. People can't live without knowing that. And so that's what I've been telling people is that, look, your life is going to be hard and that can warp and, and, and hurt you in a way that will incline you to make things worse rather than better. But you can forestall that without being naive by taking on the proper responsibility in your life for yourself and for your family and for your community. And that's real. That makes things better. It's not just a psychological paper over. It's the genuine article. And then I have all these thousands of people who are continually communicating with me who say, I've tried that. I tried that. I was desperate and I tried that. And it works. So that shouldn't be lost in the shuffle and, and in the details of my, you know, bizarre affliction. It's a sideshow. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Good talking with you. Thank you all. You too. Thank you. Don't okay. get sunburned too badly in Jamaica. <laughs> <laughs> no task. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Hello. Hi, Michaela. How are you doing? Good. Not bad. How are you? I'm okay. We're um, I'm not I'm feeling quite at my most professional, Michaela. We've got stranded in Jamaica. Oh, um, there due are, to COVID. <laughs> there are definitely worse places to be stranded. I'm, you are not wrong. I'm so um, jealous. But the Wi-Fi in the house we're currently in is slightly ropey, so I've just had a slightly nervy ten minutes. But hopefully we'll be okay. 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 Hopefully, hopefully. I don't mind. Um, and Michaela, thank you so much. This is really helpful. If I can get a sort of full briefing from you. Yeah, I just wanted to. Ideal. Um, so I'll give you the brief story. I've recounted it a whole bunch of times to every time we get a new doctor. So um, mm. I'll, I'll give you the background. And I wanted to do it because my dad is he's still not fully recovered. He's probably not going to be fully recovered for another year, to be honest. Um, and he's still extremely prone to anxiety and so any recounting of it is it knocks him out for a couple of days. So hopefully tomorrow can if I give you all the like nitty gritty nasty details, then he can fill you in on, you know, how he feels and everything. But it, he won't have yeah. to go through all all of what happened. Yeah, got you. OK, so do you um, let me start from. I'm, I'm going to let him tell his story. I'm just going to tell the medical stuff that he doesn't want to get into. Got you. Okay, so in in twenty, he he was taking uh, SSRIs for I think I believe fourteen years. It was a long time, um, and to treat fairly severe depression that seems to run in our family, and that was going. And can I ask, had you always had that all your life? We, was that sort of part of your family experience? Your father's depression? Yeah, my great grandpa had it, and he ended up on the, you know, very depressed, living on the couch for the last, you know, 10 years of his life, like very, very depressed. It hit my grandpa in his 40s. Um, and then it hit my dad. He said it was there, but it wasn't bad until his late 20s. Um, and so he didn't start taking because he, he didn't want to take medication for it. But it was starting to affect his lecturing. He wasn't able to lecture. He was working at Harvard and it started to affect his lecturing. So he started taking an SSRI and it, and it helped quite a bit. And then it hit me and it hit me when I was really little, like 12. Um, so it's this familial depression. And in 2015, um, we went on a low carb diet. 
He got a lot healthier. You can see from the videos in 2015 to 2016, he lost, he went from 218 to 160. He lost a whole bunch of weight. Um, he had GERD and gum disease that got better. He had psoriasis that got better. And his depression started to get better. So he went off of the antidepressants. And it was, things were okay. And then they weren't okay. And he went on, um, he went on Rogan and he got a lot of negative media for this, but he talked about this, uh, sodium metabisulfite response in apple cider where he had severe insomnia. And it is actually something that happened. It happened to both of us. And we now know what so happened. You were both affected by it. Yeah, yeah, it was over Christmas, and it hit him. It hit. It was really awful, but it hit him harder. He was. And that was at the end of 2016. That is that was, right? So this was after he had been off of SSRIs for about a year. This was um, at the end of 2016. Yeah. Yeah. It was at the very end of 2016. So he had this response where he got pale. He couldn't stand up without blacking out. He wasn't sleeping. He had this impending sense of doom. And he'd had similar reactions like this throughout the previous year. But then it had been interspersed with no depression and then these weird depressive um, reactions. So we had we had this reaction and he went to the doctor after about a week of being he was in really bad shape. Like um, and this was kind of. At the same time, he was under a lot of stress because the book was about to come out. I was just going to say, exactly. He was, I mean, 2016 had been a big year for him in his career. Yeah, so not only was there this health thing, but there was actual life stress going on. So there was some um, question at U of T about whether or not he was going to keep his job. Um, yeah. So that was incredibly stressful. And then just... Even just having people come up in the street, even though that was overwhelmingly positive, just going from not being known to being known was stressful. But the main, our entire family agrees, the main problem here was this weird health thing. And we were going to doctors and they didn't really know what was going on. So he was, we went, he went to the family doctor and the family doctor put him on a really low dose of a benzodiazepine. Mm -hmm. And just- And is that the same family doctor who'd been prescribing the SSRIs before then? Got yeah. So um, he just took it and it helped with his, especially with the insomnia. Um, and then he had, we didn't really think about it because he'd been taking SSRIs for, you know, 14 years. And they, he had this yeah. year where we were trying to get the depression under control. And then, so he was on another, you know, psych med and we we're like, okay, whatever. Um, at that time, we were not aware of the response some people can have to that. So he, he stayed on that and he did his world tour and things were okay. Um, were pretty good, I would say. And then my- So you weren't concerned at that point? It, all, it felt as if the sort of situation had been managed? Yeah, well, we thought, we didn't really know what these, I knew, because I have an autoimmune condition on top of it. And I'd been having these reactions, these ridiculous food reactions that was also kind of ridiculed. And so we had similar reactions and I didn't actually end up taking any medication because I was pregnant at the time. So I was like, I'm not doing anything. I'm just, whatever this is, maybe it'll go away. Um, so we didn't think about it. And about a year, so it was 20, I wanna make sure I get the years right. Um, 2020, 2019, in 20, 19, 2018, at the end of 2018, my mom got diagnosed with cancer. Yes. Um, yeah. And it was one of, it was kidney cancer, one of the better cancers. Um, and things are kind of slow in Canada. So she didn't end up getting the surgery she needed until March. And then about a month after the surgery, um, they said, oh, this isn't the type of cancer we thought it was. This is actually... Uh, collecting duct carcinoma and you have eight months and nothing helps like they said we can do surgery but there's no really no response to chemo and it's this extremely rare cancer and we did a whole bunch of research and it was this extremely rare cancer that is extremely deadly and at that point my dad's obviously it was just horrible because it was she's healthy 
She had no symptoms and then suddenly had this. And so the doctor put the benzodiazepines up and dad started to get super weird. Um, Is that what? Because I think originally he said he was on like 0.25 and then it jumped up to four milligrams. Is that right? I think that's what he's... I don't know if it started at 0.25 twice a day or 0.5 twice a day. Okay. But it was low and it went up to four. And it right. went up, it didn't go up from that to four. It went up slowly because Understood. it went up a bit and he got way worse. So he started getting what we now know is akathisia. And what did that look like? Yeah, how did that manifest, Michaela? Akathisia is a, uh, it manifested as extreme anxiety um, and suicidality. Something that he had never had being depressed. Like, he'd never had suicidal, even thoughts, um, being depressed. So this was nothing that I'd ever seen or that my family had ever seen. And we immediately thought something's going on with medication. But my mom was also on the verge of death. And so we were like, he's absolutely head over heels in love with her. Who knows how hard he's taking it? But he, it was still something was wrong, right? So then the doctor put the medication up a little bit more, and then this got worse. And and then my dad, who was trying to be stable <laughs> because of how horrible this situation was, um, went. This was this is when things got really bad. He went to a psychiatrist in Toronto, who said, "Okay, you have treatment resistant depression. Um, try ketamine." But in order to try ketamine, you need to get off of the benzodiazepines. And then he scheduled an appointment for ketamine. And I'm not happy with the psychiatrist because you can't stop taking benzodiazepines. Oh, like that. Okay. And we didn't know that. We found out, <laughs> but we didn't know that. So after, so he stopped taking them to get to do this ketamine treatment and he'd stopped like when he stopped the antidepressants, he had some side effects, but he'd he'd kind of stopped before some of the summer times he didn't take them when he felt a little bit better. So yeah. I didn't think about this. Anyway, about a week after stopping and after two ketamine treatments, he was in terrible shape. Like, and I went over to... When, so suicide. If I'd met him during that period, what would I have noticed? Like, how would he have presented um, extremely agitated and almost like somebody who was in pain. To me, it looked like pain. And, um, I went over there and I thought, and I like looked at him and I was like, oh my God, I can't even talk to this guy. Right. He's not even here. What's going on. And we called one of our friends who's a psychiatrist. And that guy said, he's in benzodiazepine withdrawal. He can't do that. Right. So he went back on, but he went to because at this point, he was like, oh, no, I have this dependency that I've formed. I need to get off of this stuff. Um, so he went back on to half the dose. Um, and then it turned out he was just in withdrawal because you have to. It's crazy. Some people have to titrate down by using drops of this medication, which isn't something a lot of doctors know. So when you're put on the medication, they're not going to say, by the way, to get off of this, you might need to cut your pill into slivers. Right. So anyway, so then he was put on um, more mood stabilizers and his akathisia, which is actually a fairly common side effect to psych meds. His akathisia got way worse. And for the last two years, we've been bouncing from doctor to doctor. Um, and for a while, his akathisia was misdiagnosed. So it took about... It took until August this summer to actually diagnose him with akathisia, which is a side effect of a medication. But he was bounced from, you know, bipolar, depression. One person diagnosed him with schizophrenia. And it was like, he just not, he's in pain because of these medications. So he went to, this is in the news too, um, we made kind of a family decision. It was like, these medications are harming you. You need to get off of them. But you can't seem to without this horrible withdrawal and worsening akathisia. So rehab. So he went to rehab in the States and they... That was on the Eastern Seaboard, is Eastern that right? Seaboard, yeah. yeah. He, um, 
it was terrible. He ended up there for, I believe he was there September until November. Oh my goodness. He was there for two months. A uh, month and a half. Yeah. Oh, I see. Right. Okay. Yeah. Or two months. Definitely September till November 2019. And he ended up on more medication coming out and in worse shape. Um, and so he went home and tried titrating down again. And again, ended up in such a, this akathisia was so bad. Akathisia makes people suicidal. It's this crawling feeling that's so bad. You can see people on YouTube trying to describe it. It's a crawling sensation that makes you not want to stop moving. Um, and so it's commonly misdiagnosed as schizophrenia because they don't know what it is. Um, and in order to treat schizophrenia, you get put on psych meds and that causes worsening akathisia. So he was in, he, we, uh, he was in a hospital in Toronto. He got back from the first rehab center mm -hmm. and then his akathisia got worse when he tried to get off these medications. Plus they had mm -hmm. added in two more. So he was in worse shape. So we hospitalized him because we were worried about his safety. Um, and it, when you were worried that he would injure himself, that he would try, that he would hurt himself. Mm -hmm. And he was worried. Right. Like, really? Oh, yeah. It was really bad. And this is not like this isn't him. Right. He's never had that kind of tendency, not even in, in the least. So we're like something. This is really bad. So he was hospitalized here in a public hospital and they diagnosed him with schizophrenia and doubled some of the medications. And so my family was there. And at this point, my grandparents had flown over. My uncle had flown over and we were going the medications are making him sick. Get him off of them. How do we get him off of them? And the hospital here said, it's schizophrenia. We should do ECT. Well, ECT. Oh, my God. Yeah, and he's there. So their entire position is that he has a psychiatric condition that they need to treat with drugs. Your entire position is that he has had psychiatric side effects from being given drugs he should not be on. Yeah. And the solution is to get him off the drugs, not to be giving yeah. him... But you're at total cross-purposes oh, at that point. Really medical bad. establishment. It was so bad. And, that, like, I can remember one of the conversations we had with this psychiatrist, he goes, he goes well, we think it's schizophrenia. And I was like, these symptoms didn't even start until he started the medications, okay? So you're telling me it's like a mid-50-year-old man with no previous symptoms of schizophrenia suddenly gets schizophrenia, which doesn't generally, it generally happens late teens for men. It's not like we're uneducated in these things, right? I was like, what? how about you remove the meds and just see if it's a side effect, given the fact it could be. And he, they wouldn't listen to us. So we called, this is my mom. This was just, I was worried my mom was going to get sick again. I was like, I don't know what causes cancer. I've been wondering what's been going on for your mom during this whole period, okay. during that whole period in 2019. So back to that. She, so she'd had the surgery and then she obviously she had those terrible problems with lymphatic drainage. Okay, so she had the surgery and then they nicked a lymph duct. And so over the next month, it was like, why isn't mom healing? Why isn't mom healing? And she ended up emer in emergency about six weeks after the first surgery. And in Canada, like we couldn't, we, we had to wait in emergency to see somebody, even though she just had the surgery. Um, and then she was in the hospital for a month. Um, she couldn't eat anything. So she was on TPN. She lost a whole, whole bunch of weight because she wasn't absorbing any nutrients and it was just, it was like a horror movie. Like every day was like a horror movie. And they're like, we don't know what to do. We can't find the leak. Um, and so we ended up, thank goodness we had have money because we stayed there and they couldn't fix it. They couldn't fix it. Um, and we ended up flying down to, um, flying down to the States. And then they did a, a surgery where they went in to try and find the leak and they couldn't find it. So they injected this poppy seed dye that sometimes works and it sealed the leak. And then she recovered in them. like, you know, not psychologically because she was, it was traumatizing, but she recovered like in days as soon as the leak okay. stopped. 
Um, but at that point, so that was August 2019. At that, but at that point, that's when your dad's starting to be in real trouble. Yeah, so he was akathisic like crazy. We didn't really understand what was going on because it's like, Dad, why are you so well, suicidal and uncomfortable? Why can't you sit down? Things are okay now. And it was because... He, you mean he would literally be unable to just sit in an armchair and, and with a glass in his hand and just have a kind of conversation where he's just sort of sitting still and focusing? Yeah. That couldn't happen? No. He was pacing. He was just pacing. It was it was like as bad as the bad videos of people on YouTube look. Were any of the doctors saying this is about grief and panic about his wife's condition? This is this is sort of nothing. This isn't a psychiatric condition. This is just this is a kind of grief response. Was that, was that that theory as well doing the rounds? No. 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 It was really like they were looking back on the. 14 years of antidepressants and saying this is a reemergence of depression um, exacerbated by the stress. Uh, but it had it didn't have the same symptoms at all. Right. He was never like his depression was like walking through tar. Right. Yeah. Like he could sit on the couch. He he napped all the time. It was like a heavy tar. It wasn't agitated panic. Yeah. So, so he's in this hospital in Toronto and they, they said, we can't get him off the medications because he needs to be sedated because he's so agitated because so that it increased everything. And at this point he was, he had this sensation to move, but he was so sedated that he couldn't move very well. And I couldn't mm -hmm. communicate with him. Like my family and I couldn't communicate with him in this hospital very well. And they wanted to do ECT for schizophrenia. And so we started calling kind of rehab clinics um, around the world. We, we contacted 57 places, my husband and I, because at this point, mm. my mom, like I said, mm. I was worried the stress was going to make her ill and it was too much. And so we wrote down all the rehab centers we could write down, called them and explained what was going on and said, he's on too many medications. He's having these side effects. Um, can you get rid of them? Uh, can you get rid of them? And Everyone we called except for two places said, no, we have to stabilize him first. And I was like, the only thing these places use to stabilize people are like antipsychotics or benzodiazepines. And we're like, those are the problems. What do we do? So this one, this sounds absolutely insane, but this one place in Russia knew who dad was and was like, yeah, we do, we do detoxes. I was wondering, when you were having these conversations with these 57 clinics, are you explaining who your father is? Is that part of the conversation or do most of them have no idea? It's just, I didn't, um, I didn't explain at that point because we also didn't know, we didn't know what was going on. We're like, this could go, we don't, we can't handle the media at the moment on top yeah. of dealing with whatever the hell is going on. Um, so no, we, we didn't tell anyone who they were until we'd had a number of conversations. But sorry, there were three yeah. places. There was a place in Israel, a place in Serbia, and a place in Russia. And Israel has a very similar medical system to like a North American medical system. So when we talked to them a number of times after we got past the money, they said, no, we'd have to stabilize him first, but don't worry, we can do that. But we'd already tried a number of psychiatrists in Canada and a rehab center in the US and a hospital in Canada. And no one had been able to stabilize him um, because it was akathisia. So uh, we went to Russia, every like my whole family, like all my, uh, my aunt and my uncle and my grandparents, we, they all flew down over Christmas. My dad was in the hospital over Christmas. Um, in 2019. And, and we talked to these guys in Russia and we said, look, he can't wean down. These medications are killing him. We could do a detox. These guys say they could do it, but it's going to be, you know, it's in Russia. First of all, um, it's got to be dangerous because no one else will do it. So what do we do? Because, and so my family agreed, okay, let's give it a shot. Did everyone agree, or was that quite a lot? Of, was that quite a complicated Christmas of just debating back and forth? No, at that point we tried a number of things. Like you know, we got we got to the point, especially when he went to the rehab center in the states, because that was a high up. It was an up there rehab center, um, and when that just made him worse, we were like, oh well, what do we do? How do we get him off these things? Do we just do it ourselves? 
Do we just like keep him safe? But he was in so much pain from this akathisia that it's like, this isn't fair. Somebody who's like this should be like, I can understand why they would sedate people because they need to be calmed down because it looks like pain or something. So we no at that point, we didn't go to Russia until we were completely out of options. Right. And we, um, we'd hoped that the hospital in Canada would help, but then they suggested keeping him on the meds and doing ECT. And it was like, that is not what his brain needs. He doesn't need to be zapped. He'll forget like the side effects. You can forget the last year or, or two. And then what if it doesn't work? Cause it's not going to, cause it's side effects. So we went to Russia, my husband's Russian. And that was the scariest thing I've ever done hands down by far. And he went, we flew, it was like a movie. We flew there on my birthday. We got there. And the day we got there, they. This is you, your husband, your, your child, and your dad. Is that right? Yeah, and a security. And was your dad able at that point to kind of walk and check in himself and navigate an airport? Or no. Did you feel very much that you were flying an invalid? We took, yeah, we took a private plane. Um, oh, did you? We took a private plane, yeah. He was too right, agitated. Okay. He was, at this point, the, the hospitals he'd been in put him on this regiment where it was like medication every three hours to try and stabilize him. So we flew with a security guard and a nurse um, to monitor the transfer um, who right. had Russian passports. So they were allowed to go because we had to get a visa over Christmas. It was like, it was absolutely ridiculous. So we, we get to Russia and they bring us to this pretty nice hospital where they do detoxes um, for people on, on drugs and most of them are opiate detoxes uh, right. so this was not a usual case um, and they do I guess in at least in eastern Europe the sedated detoxes are much more common than they are here so they use propofol they put you into a kind of a coma but a sedation and then wait till the drugs are out of your system so what they did for dad at that point he was on a lot of medication he was way worse than he had been even in the summer when my mom was sick way worse because he couldn't remember things at that point because of the medication so they put him in this propofol oh so he gets there and when he arrives he has a fever and we're like, why does he have a fever? And they do a scan, and he had pneumonia in both lungs. That's when he, that's the, that's when they find the undiagnosed yeah. pneumonia. He contracted in the Toronto hospital. Yes. So he'd had it. I don't know how long he'd had it because it was walking pneumonia. So maybe he'd been there for months, but I don't think so because when he got into the hospital in Toronto, he was walking around and he was there for two weeks. And um, at the end, when we took him out, he was just in a bed. He didn't have any energy, but it was hard to tell if it was the pills. I, yes. So we got there and they, he has a... No, just ask, sorry. What did, did, presumably, did you tell the Toronto Hospital what you were doing? You were discharging him in order to take him to Russia? We, what was their response? We didn't get his medical records. They, they, um, they were not okay with it. We had to sign papers taking full responsibility of whatever happened. So he was discharged against doctor's orders. And they were annoyed about it enough that they wouldn't give us his papers, which is not even legal, right? You're supposed to get discharged oh, papers. It was a complete mess. But um, I think they were confused because whatever was going on with him was very severe. They hadn't seen it before and they knew who he was. So right. it was just um, it was just a mess. And they're like, what are you doing? You're going to Russia. They're just like, what is happening? But we certainly weren't going to keep him on the drugs and do ECT under a diagnosis of schizophrenia. And he was well enough that he talked to the psychiatrist and was like, look, I'm not having delusions like I'm not schizophrenic. I'm just I I can't stop moving. I have this crawling sensation. Right. I have this impact. He, he wanted to go to Russia. Yeah, he agreed. So, like, we, we made sure, because in case something mm -hmm. terrible happened, we needed everybody to be on the same page. So, yes. yeah, it was not, that was a really awful Christmas. So, so, um, so everyone was on the same page. We got to Russia. They put him in this um, detox, and then he ended up being intubated, which he wasn't supposed to be, um, because of this freaking double. Because of the name yeah. yeah. So... That was horrible because that was terrifying. So during the um, 
during the detox, they did something called plasma phoresis, which takes your blood and cleans it, um, which kind of sounds like something out of science fiction, but it's a real thing. And they could test benzodiazepines have such a long half life that yeah. there's yeah, there's a theory that maybe some of the withdrawal is because you still have benzodiazepines in you. Yeah. So the plasma phoresis got rid of everything. And when we got there, the Russian doctors, who I couldn't communicate with, which was terrifying, but my husband... So was everything being done by your husband at that point? Yeah, so my something. husband, to me, to my husband, to me. Yeah. But that that was awful, too. Um, I was like, how long can, how fast can I learn Russian? But it's difficult. Um, so where was I? Oh, yeah, when we got there, they said, we think he's been poisoned and that this was on purpose. The Russian doctors, they're like, we think someone was doing this on purpose. And I was like, no, it, it's just a whole, it's just kind of what happens, right? If you have these symptoms, you get put on these other medications. And he just, it, it was really not on purpose. But they're so much more careful in Eastern Europe because there's not as much, sounds like a conspiracy theory, but there's not as much payment to doctors from pharmaceutical companies so it, doctors don't care if they use certain meds. So benzodiazepines are almost never prescribed. And even the other psych meds, I'll get to that. Anyway, so he does this detox. Um, he wakes up. He was sedated with these and intubated for nine days. Um, I mean, what were you doing, Michaela? You, you sort of, where, where are you and your husband and child at that point? Anyway, so we just shown up we, we stayed at a hotel for a couple of days then got an airbnb then found us someone to help with scarlet because we were spending time at the hospital making sure everything was not being sketchy because it's russia <laughs> i don't know it didn't look sketchy but you want to make sure it's not sketchy so we you feel in good hands or could you not really tell Initially, yeah, it looked really good. The, the hospital we first went to looked um, like decades ahead of the hospitals I've seen in Canada, the public ones. It was super clean. When you walked in, we, we got there and, you know, I can still communicate with dad. He's just in a lot of pain. We get there and there are these shoe covers. You step into this machine and it covers your shoe in plastic automatically. Oh, yeah, um, yeah which he'd never seen before. And he was like, we got to, this is genius. Now in the era of COVID, it might be genius. But um, anyway, we, uh, so he was relieved too. My dad was relieved when he got there because he was like, he thought he was going to die. He was like, I keep going to hospitals. They keep putting me on more medication. I'm akathisic. I can't control it. Um, I'm going to die. Um, so we were at that point and that's why we ended up in Russia. So he does the he does the detox and he wakes up and he's in bad shape, like um, when he's delirious, delirious, but also not really talking. So when he first so he's conscious. So when you arrive at his bedside, how does he seem? Um, I thought he was catatonic. So bad, really, really, really bad. So when he first woke up, he was there a little bit. Oh, actually, when he first first woke up, so this was nine days after, he told me uh, the akathisia is gone. That that was it. Um, the akathisia is gone, and I was like, okay, well, thank God for that because that's what was making him suicidal. The akathisia is gone, um, and we couldn't. It was a hospital, so there were visiting hours, so we couldn't stay. We came the next day, and then he wasn't responding. He was catatonic. And I went to the, I couldn't communicate with the doctors. I went to the doctors and I was like, he needs, it's like, he needs to be stabilized, but don't use, you know, this array of medication, but something is really wrong. What's happening? What's going on? Um, and because realistically, these guys hadn't really done detoxes from a whole bunch of psych meds. They were used to dealing with people on opiates, realistically. Edwards. Yeah. Um, anyway, so he was, he was catatonic and then he was delirious so um we came in the next day and he thought my husband was his old roommate so it's just, your husband was his old roommate yeah who died um, oh my god oh it, it was horrible so he oh my god. yeah so i was like he, you know this is a huge problem he needs to 
they're not he's not being something's wrong and he's not being taken care of anyway so the people we well, must have been panicking at that point about I, I, things he got. Hair. I was like I, I'm the, yeah like i lost i've got a whole bunch of hair extensions in this is not this is not all me but yeah i've never been that stressed in my entire life and my husband obviously we'd brought dad here and it was like what did the detox do it was it too yeah. hard on his brain like um it looked like it was going to take him like two years to recover if he was going to recover it was it was really bad and so he got transferred to a reanimatology clinic um which is for people with severe like head trauma basically three hours north of moscow a public russian hospital and <laughs> and um oh. pardon Oh yeah! Oh, so you mean so they so when they, so when he comes out of, of the induced coma, the delirium, they say, "Whoops, we'll just send him off to the public hospital because they'll have to." Yeah. So at that point, I was like, "We have." Oh, you must have been freaking out at that I was, point. And this isn't just like I was like the entire. I'm fucked if this goes badly because the entire world is going to blame me. Because who brings somebody to detox, first of all, from these medications in Russia? I was like, this is really bad. Plus, more importantly, this is my dad and this isn't fair. Like, what's this isn't fair. He's been injured by medication that he was put on. Um, so we get to the reanimatology clinic and the, oh. and the, re, the head doctor, Andre. So I couldn't even go inside. I was in the car and I was like green and nauseous. And I was just like. He's not going to remember this. Like, Andre, you go. Because I can't talk to anyone. I'm just going to yell at people. Right? At that point, I was just going in and yelling at people. And I was like, I can't just go into this and yell at someone in English. It's not helpful. So he went in and he came out and he was green. And I was like, what did they say? And he said that he'd explained why we'd come, that he was being put on too many medications back home and that they wouldn't remove them. And he was going to die. And we brought him here. And the head nurse had said, oh, so you brought him here so we can finish the job. And so we went home that day. And, you know, that was not a good day. I had a like, I what was the hospital like? It was like out of a movie. It was three hours north of Moscow. Uh, so you had to drive in Moscow winter up there, which is insane. Uh, it had a guarded fence around it. Um, it was like Soviet era hospital from a movie. Uh, it was hu a huge center and it was full of really, thank God, really, 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 really skilled doctors. So it, I went the next day and dad was back. Whatever they had done had just, so I, I got there and he, he hadn't been moving, right? He sits up and he looks at me and he goes, you are in so much trouble. And I was like, dad, <laughs> dad. Um, and he, he was really confused by that response because he's like, I'm just, yeah, I'm just mad at you. And you're just like th happy to see me. And so we explained, because he was still pretty out of it. Um, we explained, you know, he couldn't even remember getting on the plane. He couldn't remember getting on the plane to go to Russia. So wow. he couldn't remember the entire hospital in um, Toronto. Wow. Yeah, so he went from like, early December to waking up in a Russian hospital. Jesus. I know it doesn't, it's absolutely absurd. I don't know what, he's forgotten the whole of his Toronto hospital experience so, and the journey to Russia and the, to re, the detox clinic. So he's gone through, he's lost everything. Like a month and a half. Yeah. yeah. A month and a half. Yeah. yeah. And I think that was because, so he was akathisic, at the beginning of December, um, hold on, I'm just going to close this door. Um, anyway, and then when he went into this hospital in Toronto, they had literally doubled some of the medications he was on um, to stabilize him. And, and then he didn't remember anything after that. But what have they done in the public hospital in Russia? What have they done overnight okay. to bring him back? So, what did they do? So they had, they had given him, when I looked at the list, because I was like, did they give him a benzodiazepine? Like, 
<laughs> what exactly is going on here? Um, and they had given him a whole bunch of really low dose kind of everything. But most importantly, from what we learned, um, he was on using Dextor, which is something they use for, they use it for surgery to put, it's kind of like propofol. They use it to sedate people who are in a lot of pain or for surgery and to calm people down, but it's not a benzodiazepine or an antipsychotic or one of these sedative drugs. It's called Dextor, Dexmedidine, I think, in, um, in the U.S. Uh, and so he was, he had this IV of Dextor, um, and then they'd, they added in a whole bunch of vitamins. Like, they just threw everything at him to try and get him to stabilize, but they didn't use benzodiazepines, which is... Yeah. at the time, which is what we were concerned about. Um, and over the next, you, he was like, okay, get me out of here like right now. And I, oh, cause we had to go the stupid hospital. It was, there was no, in Russia, you can bribe people and it's a bit more loose with rules. And this hospital was like Soviet era. There was no staying over the time limit. Like it didn't matter who you are, what you were offering. Um, so there were two hours of visiting or two hours of visiting hours, um, a day. So we drove three hours there, uh, to visit and then three hours home. And over the next, uh, I can't remember exactly. He was in there for, I believe eight days. It wasn't very long thinking back on it, given the state he was in, but he, every day was get me out of here, get me out of here. And it was like, well, dad, you have to be able to walk. You have to, because he couldn't walk at this point. He couldn't walk. No, and we don't know, like, why exactly. Right. Was it, uh, presumably at that point you want to understand what on earth has happened and why he is the way he is. Yeah, and even the people who'd done the detox were like, this isn't, you know, we don't know. And they had, they were, they had good doctors, but no one could explain why, what had happened exactly. So the he, detox team had no idea about why he'd, why he'd emerged in that way. Well, the, All they knew was that they were more familiar with detoxing opioids. Than, that's not exactly, than they knew. that's not exactly true. The head psychiatrist at this reanimatology clinic, they did MRIs and CT scans to try and figure out what was going on, to see if there was brain damage or anything. And they looked at the MRI and they said, oh, he has damage from the SSRIs. And I was like, what? And they're like, yeah, he has brain changes from the SSRIs because he was on the SSRIs for so long. And I was like, okay, whatever. Like, I kind of just ignored that. Um, that comes into play a little bit later. So they did see brain changes. They didn't say brain damage. They said brain changes. Um, but they couldn't really identify what was going on through scans, which was good. <laughs> like, nothing's really wrong. They said that there was a bit of ischemic damage, but it looked old. So it really wasn't clear what had happened. Um, and so over the next eight days, he went from sitting up in bed to like shuffling to walking to basically running down the halls. And he was like, I'm, I'm getting out of here. He got off of the deck store in a, in a week. And then when we left, when we left that place, we drove. So then he was going to the actual rehab center. Not that he was a rehab patient. But they did neurological rehab as well. So, and we had no, we couldn't bring him home. He needed too much care. Um, he was still like not, not well. When we brought him out of that hospital, he could barely walk. He couldn't, he didn't really understand where his feet were. He said, he's like, I'm blind. Like I'm, I'm blind with my feet. So he'd hit his feet on things. Um, he forgot how to type. So he put his hands on the keyboard and he's like, it's not there. I don't know how to type. And we were just like, Jesus, this is not good. <laughs> like, this is really not good. Um, and so he went and stayed at the rehab center, which we, you know, drove. Is that the one in Florida? No, this was still in Russia. This is the people okay. who would organize the detox. So this is now the third place in Russia, yes. you mean? So the first yeah, deal... So this is location number three in Russia. Yeah, location number three. The, the, for the deal was he does the detox in a hospital and he moves to the rehab center. The, the reanimatology clinic was not supposed to happen. He was not supposed to... I understood. To I see. So, that, so this was always where he was meant to be convalescing after the detox. Got you. Yes, exactly. So he's there um, and... We, I was carefully met monitoring the medication because I was like, I don't want, I know that these medications make him sick. So like remove everything that's not 
you know, he was on proton pump inhibitors. They'd added in a whole bunch of things. And I was like, he doesn't need a whole bunch of this stuff. I was going to say that what you're trying to do is get him off meds, not onto more right at yeah, that point. And so that was annoying. But he ended up on, and here's where things get tricky. So he ended up on a very, very low dose of an antipsychotic um, to stabilize um, and a very low dose of an antidepressant. We're, and we thought, okay, these are like tiny amounts. If that's what he needs to be stable, we can get rid of those later when we're at home, like whatever. So he's doing pretty good. He's getting better and better. We're going for walks. One of his friends flew out, got a visa, flew out and stayed with him like all day because so that someone was there with him. We, we talked to the rehab center. They were really, they took a huge risk bringing him in there and they were really helpful with letting people stay and visit but he was like, I want to go home. This is Russia. This is like scary. Um, and we wanted to go home. And we thought, OK, we'll go to Florida because he's not. I didn't want to bring him back to Toronto with mom because it was still too much work taking care of him. Like he needed nurses and things. So we went to Florida and then my brother came to visit and was like, oh, my God, you know, dad's better, like a lot better. So this had been a month. It was horrible. At this point, can we, you know, would you dad wake up in the morning, kind of walk to breakfast, read the papers, send some emails? Was it that level of function or not really? No, no. he was staying in bed until mid-afternoon. But then he'd get up and swim. He was barbecuing, right? So, and, but he was like kind of quieter than, than normal and a little bit slower than he should be. Slower or more muted. Yeah, right. and muted. Yeah, and I was like, okay, well, he'll. I'm more comfortable that he'll recover now, but something's a bit off. So we're there for a week and a half, and the akathisia comes back. And we're like, oh, God. Oh, God. It was so, oh, it was so awful. He, uh, yeah, he called me, and he's, he's like, I'm, you know, it's, this akathisia ba is back. I'm suicidal again. And it was just like, what is going on? So we thought it was... After all that. Yeah. After all that. Yeah. And it was like, why? It was gone. It was gone nine days after all the medications left. Like, it just started to... Like, what, what's going on? And I thought, it's the medications. It's got to be the medications. Even in this very low dose, anti was it um, antidepressant yeah. and antipsychotic? Yeah. Um, but we were also getting information from doctors that this could be like protracted benzodiazepine withdrawal that just popped up now. So really, yeah, it it wasn't. It turns out it was akathisia from the medication. But um, we didn't know that. And so at that point, we're like, well, what do we do? We've already called at the hospitals in the the U.S. And if we bring him there when he's akathisic, they're going to put him on meds. They've already they've straight up told us that. It's like, we're not going back to Russia. Thanks. Um, I was like, w you know, what do we do now? So we thought maybe it'll just go away. Maybe this is protracted benzodiazepine withdrawal and it'll just go away. So we stayed with him. My grandparents came down um, and we stayed with him and for months and the akathisia got worse and it got worse. And cognitively, he was getting clearer, but he was in a lot of pain. So it's numbness on his left side, this inability to sit down and lay down, um, this urge to walk around and this suicidality from this crawling sensation, uh, and super, super low blood pressure. So he, whenever he stand up, he, he'd black out. Right. Um, anyway, so we contacted this, that clinic in Serbia. Oh, one of the doctors from Serbia had flown out when dad was in the re reanimatology clinic because we had wanted to obviously wanted a second opinion we're like what are these people doing we need a we need someone who knows what they're doing here just to check on them and he'd come and he, and he came this actually made us feel way better he came and said this is good he's doing well and we we're like oh well thank god for that so we'd had like an outside outside source check on these guys because at that point we were like these guys don't know what they're doing um Anyway, so we were in contact with the Serbian clinic, and this was like top of the world private hospital where a lot of people from mid the Middle East go to. Sorry. Excuse me, my dog's just got a shush, shush. Sorry, she's just going nuts. Sorry, carry on. Okay. So we, we, talked to this, we talked to this doctor, and 
he said, you know, you should come to this neuro rehab clinic. We do. We deal with this stuff. I've dealt with this stuff before. I've dealt with benzo withdrawal. Um, and his akathisia, he didn't go off of these medications because, well, they were such a small amount. Nobody knew that they could cause such severe responses. So we ended up, it got to the bad, it got so bad that he was a danger to himself and my family couldn't handle it anymore. It was like my grandparents were there helping take care of him and it was just like, it was way too much. So we went to Serbia. So when you say too much, so you were still in the clinic in Florida, you mean? No, we were at no. home. So this is at the same time. We flew there late, so, late February. COVID happened in March. So like everything shut down March, April. So he, we had rented a house and we're staying with them, taking care of them from... In which city, sorry? Um, Palm Beach. Okay, got you. We just right. wanted to, yeah, kind of relax and heal. <laughs> yes. Um, and then COVID yeah. hit and then we were taking care of like my family, my grandparents, my dad in this COVID mess. I was like, oh my God, this is a disaster. So anyway, months passed, like horrible months passed. He's so you're all in this house in Palm Beach, kind of pretty much in semi-lockdown, trying to look after your dad. And he's getting worse and we have no idea why. And he's suicidal. Although and he, it, it would be, so his symptoms are, they're way worse in the morning than they are in the evening. So in the evening, he'd actually be pretty good. It was weird. It would like, he'd do, he'd do a whole bunch of swimming. He'd do some weights, even in his horrible state, he'd do this stuff. And then by like 5.30, he could sit down and have dinner. And by 9 p.m., we'd watch TV and he'd be laying on the couch watching TV. And he'd, he had a bit of a sense of humor. It was absolutely absurd. And then it'd be like, shit, the morning is going to happen again. Like, what is going on? He was like, how much am I contributing? Like, is this in my head? Just, we had no idea what was going on. So we went to Serbia and we get to Serbia and you probably saw the podcast dad and I did together. Um, so they put him in under propofol again because he was so anxious. And of course he's like, I'm back in Eastern Europe. I'm never going to see my wife. I'm never going to go home. <laughs> like I'm doomed. Is he articulating all of these things? In sort of yeah, he was doing better. Like at, at that point for, he wasn't less, he wasn't in a better place, but at least he was more cognitively there. But, but there are great sort of effusions of anxiety and riffing on all the kind of yeah. sort of worst case scenarios. Worst case for sure. Um, although it wasn't unreasonable given what had happened. So, so they seemed to stabilize him. They did this proper fall sleep, which seemed to help. And we figured maybe he wasn't sleeping, right? Because some people go into benzo withdrawal and they can't sleep. So we're like, I don't know what happened, but thank God he's back. Although he was a little like, honestly, I would say stoned. He seemed kind of stoned, but I was like, I don't care. He's at least he's relaxed. Thank goodness. Um, and then about three weeks later, the akathisia came back and the doctor there was like, what is going on? And so that's where he was diagnosed with akathisia. And that doctor said, I can't help because I can't use any medication to help him. It's the medications causing these problems and there isn't anything I can do. And um, at that point, well, we were like, well, at least that makes sense, right? It's not in his head. It's a side effect. Um, and they ended up using, they ended up using a, an, a partial opiate um, because, so this is something that it's been difficult to know how much of this to talk about and how much of it not to talk about, because since I, we put out a video saying, Hey, my, you know, dad's in rehab. This is what's going on because people are going to find out anyway. And we were back in September 2019. Yeah. Um, yeah. that was September, 2019. Yeah. And because yeah. we've always been pretty honest about what's going on. And it was like, he's writing these self-help books. He's having a hard time. Like we can't it's worse if we kind of keep that hidden. So we'd been, and it was so much to bear that telling, keeping people updated when he just disappeared was, was, um, ideal. But the problem with that is I've had probably 3000 people email me asking 
how dad's got his akathisia under control because there are people who are suicidal living daily with akathisia being treated with psych meds and that are probably worsening the symptoms because akathisia is just so poorly understood yeah. so anyway so what he what he did was he started using uh suboxone which doesn't okay. it's it's like a it's a partial opiate and technically they use it to treat people who are addicted to opiates to get them off of it, um, which obviously wasn't his problem, but it also has calming properties and it's used to treat akathisia. Okay. Yeah. So if you, there are studies online too, if you find someone who really knows what they're doing, um, they can safely use opiates to treat akathisia because you can't use any of the other sedating drugs. Like any of the psych meds can trigger it. SSRIs, SNRIs, antipsychotics really really can benzodiazepines Which is what you've been described. like like he tried all of them so um the serbian clinic had tried everything it was insane they tried everything because they had stabilized him initially but it turns out akathis is a little bit more complicated it's delayed so it doesn't happen necessarily it doesn't necessarily happen as soon as you take the medication for my dad it happens three weeks later Hi. so that that's why he kept getting better, and then the akathisia would come back. I better, see. The akathisia would come back. So, um, so when we're in Serbia for three months trying to stabilize him, because this doctor is just like, I can't believe this, because it, it's fairly rare, and his was so severe that it was very rare. Um, and he, so we ended up flying him home. Um, I, I came home actually to organize the transfer. My husband stayed there with him. Um, we got COVID when we were there. That's not even like that. Yes. That's I. Did you? Did you? Did you did, I got the story that you and your husband and daughter moved into the hospital. Okay, so. And then caught it in the hospital. Is that correct, or have I got that wrong? I don't know where we caught it from, but um. So when we got to Serbia, Serbia is interesting. It was completely open, completely open. So going from the states to Serbia was like whoa, and the government had said there are no COVID cases there. I remember when Serbia had that sort of golden zone, golden zone, yeah. yeah. And we were so not, like, because my dad was, we weren't concerned. COVID was, like, least on our list of problems. Um, so anyway, then, <laughs> then elections happened. There were, and then they shut down the country. Like, days after elections, they were like, oh, COVID is everywhere. Um, mandatory quarantine. And then there were riots. Um, my nanny, at that point, got hit on the outskirt of a cr outskirt of a crowd with tear gas <laughs> um, oh, because of the riots because people were like hey you said there was no covid and now it's everywhere and you just like their elections are a little off so so we we all it was either quarantine at home and not see dad at all or quarantine in the hospital yeah. and at this point I so, see, yeah. Yeah. So we were, I was like, no freaking way are we doing that. So we stayed in a, in a room in the hospital. And 11 days into quarantine, my daughter probably was the first one to get symptoms. She just had an upset stomach. And then my nanny had an upset stomach. And then I had an upset stomach. But it was like, whatever. It's like an upset stomach. It's not that bad. So quarantine was over. This is 14 days. We moved back home. Um, and as soon as we got home, the hospital is like, Jordan has, we tested him because they're testing all the time. Jordan has COVID and we're still all sick. Right. But we're like, no freaking way. Like, are you kidding me? So we all got COVID, including my nanny. Everyone at the hospital got COVID. Um, Igor, the head guy of the hospital, he'd already had COVID. Like a lot of people had, had antibodies already there. Um, and then they treated dad preemptively. So you can take like some of the protocols involve, involve antibiotics and steroids preemptively, which I wasn't a huge fan of because my dad doesn't react well to medication. And I was like, why don't you wait for the symptoms before you put him on medication because he doesn't react well. Um, so they ended up using, so we weren't allowed to go visit him. Cause he was in like, we weren't allowed to go visit him for five days. And I got there and he was in the worst shape. Like I, he was just, he was so agitated. It was hard to believe. And, 
And sort of give, give an example of how that would. Do you mean he was sort of physically agitated, but sort of facially agitated? Do you mean when he was talking, he was physically facial moaning, like um. The easiest way, honestly, there are videos of people with akathisia on YouTube. It looks like okay. that. So it was okay. bad. And everyone in the hospital was freaked out. Um, and I was like, there's because he was way worse than he was a week ago. Um, and I was like, oh, my God, are they using fluoroquinolones? Because at this point, I've. I've read so much on this stuff. It's absolutely absurd. And I know that there's a class of antibiotics that you're not supposed to give to people who are in benzo withdrawal because um, uh, it's called fluoroquinolones. And I was like, please, like, please let them not be using fluoroquinolones. Turns out they were using fluoroquinolones and the si the interaction is not very well read, well known. It's, it's just absurd that these things kept happening. They don't use fluoroquinolones as much in the States because they have side effects. Um, people can get like poisoned from them. They're they're just a intense class of antibiotics. So he turns out he was on fluoroquinolones, and I flipped and was like, "We're pulling him out n now, even though it wasn't safe because he was akathisic." I was like, "We're pulling him out n now unless you stop the fluoroquinolones, like now." Um, and Andre talked to the head doctor, who was also really stressed out at this point because it's like, "What am I doing wrong? I've tried everything." And he was a really good guy. He's probably the best doctor I've met. Um, but he was super stressed out. He was pissed off being questioned. Um, but he did drop the fluoroquinolones and dad got a lot better really quickly. So, okay, God. but th so this was after we'd recorded this freaking podcast being like, Hey, I'm <laughs> stably doing better. And then got like yeah. COVID and akathisia. And I was like, I was like, Oh my God, this again. So anyway, he's, after that, he was put on Suboxone. The Suboxone helped a lot, the akathisia, but it was still kind of there. We go home. So it was September. So he's home, finally. Um, we'd left in January. It's September. We hadn't been home for nine months. Yeah, September. Yeah. Um, he's home. So he hasn't seen your mom in nine months. So. Mom, came, mom came to Florida to visit. Okay. Um, and then went home. And we're trying to keep her stress levels very low because of how sick she was. It was just like, exactly. he didn't want, you know, it was better for her to not see this. Um, so she came to visit in Florida and she also came, this was so, this was really hard on dad. This was really hard on everybody. Uh, she came to Serbia and literally the day after she arrived, um, they locked everything down. And the head of the hospital said, we're going into quarantine and you should go home because you've had cancer. You're at a high, higher risk. You should go home. And it, we were I was so angry because I was like. Dad was so looking forward to seeing her. And then it was like, you got to go home two days. Um, but we did end up getting covid and she didn't. So. He was yeah. probably right about that to be honest. Yeah. Um, at the time it didn't feel good, but we did end up getting COVID and she didn't. So, yeah. um, so anyway, we get home and he's doing like, he's still not in good shape. He's waking up late. He's, um, and he's akathisic. So it's the pacing, the uncomfortable crawling sensation. So he's still in discomfort and he's pacing and he's yeah. agitated. Yeah. Numbness, burning sensations, like really bad neurological stuff. And uh, this is nine months after you did the detox now. Yeah. Yeah. So he goes to a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist puts him on an antipsychotic. And I go, my, my husband and I had a, made a, had a fit, right? We were like, we have seen this happen a whole bunch of times. He was diagnosed with akathisia in three weeks. We're going to be totally fucked. Um, yeah. And people, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And people, because they hadn't, it, because everyone was completely stressed out and people here hadn't seen what was going on, they were kind of like, just take a break, guys. You need to take a break, which was true because... I was just thinking, you've now done that. You've been full kind of medical mode for the best part of a year at that point, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're like, okay, we'll take a break. Maybe this will work. Like, you know, just like maybe it'll work because initially it works. He's feeling better. So it works. So then they add in an antidepressant. Three weeks later, the, it was so bad again. It was, it was like 12 hours of akathisia. Um, 
com- and and so um, Andre and I got got involved again and said that psychiatrist is fine. Oh, first, first what happened is we called the, our family doctor and said he's akathisic again. The psychiatrist isn't listening. He's treating him for bipolar. It's making the akathisia worse. Can we have a referral to another? psychiatrist and our doctor said no it's like leave it alone just let them do it and we were like okay so we had to switch gps so then we did you get the feeling at that point that you're being perceived as the problem i was complete yes 100 percent. but when did that begin clearly at that moment did you feel that before that moment or was that the first time you felt as if you were being regarded as the problem or oh no i've been problematic for a while (laughs) <laughs> right this is this is not new i've i'm pr- right. um i'm pretty pushy when i think something is wrong and because of because i've had issues with an autoimmune disorder that i've managed to get under control with an absolutely absurd diet i've had to sure, be, exactly. i've had to be pretty pushy um i've had to be pretty pushy. did you want to maintain that diet throughout this whole period we're discussing through all these hospitals so the diet never changed um, no, it did change when we were in Serbia. It got it expanded a bit, a little bit. He had like fruits and things. It didn't seem to make much difference. Like he he was just so screwed. Um, I'll, I'll get to the diet in a sec. Let me let me wrap sure. up because so, anyway, so the family GP said no, I won't give you the referral to another psychiatrist. Yeah, just so you then get a new family GP. Yeah, so we got a new family GP. We got we were like that's it. The meds have to go. So when he came back from Serbia, he was on the Suboxone and he was also on a sleeping pill to help him sleep at night. And at this point, we're like, everything has to go because it turns out you can get akathisia from like every everything and sleeping pills like antipsychotics, antidepressants, benzodiazepines, opiates, much, much rarer. But um, those ones. So we're like, okay, maybe when he came back from Serbia because he was still on the sleeping pill, that was giving him this underlying akathisia. And then it was made worse by these two new other drugs so anyway um over the next two week period uh with this other gp everything was removed except for suboxone um and he slowly got better but it was not fast and it was really quite bad but it was instead of 12 hours it was eight hours and then it was like six hours but even a minute of this akathisia makes people insane because it's so uncomfortable so it was still like hours a day and he'd go to bed and he'd be like, oh my God, I feel normal. It's going to happen again in the morning. So at that point I went on this rampage and I contacted, I'd done this before, but I did a new search now that I knew that we were looking for akathisia to try and find akathisia experts. And I found one in Vancouver and in the UK. So all the way up until this point, when, when it was diagnosed in service, what were you calling it before then? Benzodiazepine withdrawal. Got you. Okay. Yeah. So akathisia because of benzodiazepine withdrawal, not akathisia because of psych meds, which is what it was. So anyway, so we do a whole bunch. I do a whole bunch of consultations with, I talk to five different specialists, akathisia specialists, um, and tell them the whole story. I had typed up like 12 pages of medical notes with everything that had happened, sent them all over to these akathisia specialists. And it's just like, plus I was getting thousands of emails from people telling me what worked for them. So there's a lot of information, and I, um, I had Dad do a couple of consults with these doctors, and we finally found this akathisia specialist who goes, so it turns out people who take SSRIs for a very, very long time, especially if it's at a high dose, if they stop taking it, not only can they have protracted withdrawal, which causes insomnia, impending doom, panic, um, people usually treat that by going sugar-free and low-carb because they're so sensitive, their brain is so sensitive that it reacts to um, chemicals, light, uh, smell, and high carbs, like sugar. And so I th- we thought, okay, that maybe that's why when we went low-carb, because we were eating meat, right? Because everything else was causing this horrible impending doom. I was like, maybe that was SSRI withdrawal. And so this the psychiatrist... Um, said, yeah, that's that's from the SSRI withdrawal. And the interesting thing is I had that similar... So I went on this meat diet and I stopped taking SSRIs that I've been taking for 11 years. And I had these reactions with carbs that were just absolutely horribly absurd. Um, and they don't happen anymore. 
So I still have an autoimmune disorder that I have to deal with, but these impending doom insomnia reactions stopped happening. Um, and a lot of people I've talked to who do this meat diet are getting off of meds. And so I think it must have something to do with that. And according to this psychiatrist, you can go on a low carb diet to help ameliorate some of these uh, psych side effects. So apparently people who are on SSRIs for a long time, if they start up again on a benzodiazepine or an antipsychotic, they're way more likely to get akathisia than the general public. I see. So he looked at the case and he said, yep, he took those for 14 years. He went off and then when he went back on, they caused uh, going up and everything caused akathisia. And he's been on, he was on psych meds for the whole year. So that's the akathisia. And what you have to do, he's like, the opiates help. So just stay on that, get off of everything else and wait. And it was just like, what? And this guy was, he just moved, he'd moved to Toronto five months, um, not Toronto, just outside of Toronto five months ago. So he's just new here. I think he's from Australia. Um, and he's an ac he's like one of the top akathisia specialists in the world. Um, and he explained everything. And so now dad is, once all the antipsychotic stuff were gone, um, and he started, he's mad at the akathisia's lifted. He hasn't been akathisic now for a number of weeks, which is the first time that's happened. He's only on Suboxone. He's gone. He's cut it down in half, right? So it, it's going away. He only needed it because of this akathisia covering the symptoms. Um, and so it's over now. Like he's, uh, he's anxious. He's very prone to stress. He's got PTSD 100% from the last number of years. Um, but we know that the akathisia is caused by any medication, basically, that's a psych med. And it's gone now. But holy shit was that. That was a bad year. <laughs> So we had Christmas this year, and he opened all his gifts from last Christmas. It's been like, it was, it was just absurd. We're just like, how the hell did that happen? But uh, we have a great GP now who completely understands what's going on, who, who, who actually knew about akathisia. He was like, why was he put on an antipsychotic if he has akathisia? And I was like, I don't know. That's what I've been saying. Um, so we've got a great GP and he's doing he just re, he just released a podcast with Matthew McConaughey so he's still not he still has to recover he's walking a lot but he's like the akathisia is not there but he can get up in the morning yeah yeah he's he's getting up at eight then he's having a sauna he's physically active. Yeah, he found we found saunas okay so when I when I talked to this a psychiatrist and he said this SSRI withdrawal can have this impending doom panic, I was like, oh, I had that for like two years after I stopped SSRIs, but I had a baby and I was so convinced to control this without meds. And I was kind of, I was like, something makes me feel weird with those. I don't want to take those. Um, so I had it for two years. And one of the things that really helped was infrared saunas. No idea why, but getting in there and sweating made a massive difference if I could do that and my mom built an infrared sauna in the basement so dad goes into the infrared sauna in the morning um then he eats then he walks for like 10 kilometers oh wow yeah, yeah 10 to 15 he's walking a ton so somebody walks with him every day um and then in the afternoon he works and so and his book is coming out in March and um, yeah, how do you think about prospect of that? I think he's going to recover fully. I think from my experience, which was not like his, I never had, like, he had it so bad, the akathisia and stuff, but from my experience, it took a couple of years to recover from all the medication I was on. I think that he's... Well, you have to delay the book coming out by a year. Yeah. Yeah, I, bet I you mean, will. we... That's a debate. Oh, yeah, like, we ha I had a call with a publisher when we were in Russia. And I, at that point, my dad was like, I'm never getting better. Just publish it. And I was like, am I going to have to like, it's not even done. Like, what, what do we do? Um, but he worked on it through this akathisia period. He worked on it and finished the book, edited it, did the audio book. He did. Well, while he was in Florida or in Serbia. And so he was editing in Florida and Serbia. 
Um, he'd finished right. I think he finished writing in Florida, editing in Serbia, and then he did the audio book in December. Um, oh. Right at the right when we solidified that this was akathisia caused by it wasn't just caused by benzodiazepines it was caused by anything it was the SSRIs, yeah. yeah and yeah so um he's doing way better but i mean it's been hard on my family like they were they were anxious about this interview because they're like what's it gonna cause and we figured because he has his book coming out in march we don't want the questions surrounding the book release to be all health focus. Yeah. No, I, the logic of doing it this way makes complete sense. Yeah, then you've got to play around with the actually focusing on the book. Yeah, the and, book and at least there's been like hints of, you know, there was a podcast and things, so people are kind of up to date. But um, we figured. What kind of feedback have you had online? Uh, like horribly negative. Um, horribly what? Negative. Like. Um, really? Yeah, it's been pretty hard on me. Uh, because go on, tell me, Michaela. We well, we went to Russia, and it was like you brought, you know, your. I get a lot of people being like, "You're killing your dad. You're killing your dad with your diet, and you're killing your dad." You know, bringing him to Russia. It's trolls, um, but it's really, it was really hard, especially when I was like in Russia, being like. So they were all attacking you for being in Russia for taking him to Russia. Yeah, because they didn't understand, right? And they didn't know. Oh, we tried a whole bunch of hospitals. We called fifty-seven of them, right? We went to one of the top rehab centers in the states. We went to a hospital in Canada. Like, they did. They were just like, you just brought him to Russia, which, like, yeah, I get it. And then people don't care if you're removed, but um, it's been hard. So part of the reason, yeah, it's been really hard. And of course, there's a lot of there's a lot of support too. Which is like Jordan's back, like thanks for the help there. Um, but you always see the negative more. And it's pretty easy to make it a negative story because I already have this weird you only eat meat diet. Um, although I was really using that to treat health ser serious health problems, and so is dad. It's not like I force feed him, right? It's it's up to him what he does. But um it's an easy story to twist because it's like all meat diet goes to Russia for a detox that you're not supposed to do on these medications. I get it, but it has been hard because of how stressful the year's been anyway. Unbelievably so. And there's a whole family who kind of been united about what the best thing to do is at each point. I imagine that that feels optimistic. I mean, family is difficult. Isn't it? We're, we're good now, but it's been hard throughout the whole thing because for part of it, Part of it, they like I. We had certain family members that were like, "It does look like an underlying problem." He was depressed. It is an underlying problem, and so there were yeah. times when it was just me being like, "This is medication. These are side effects." But then all the doctors are also saying it's an underlying problem. And you put any family under a whole bunch of stress, and people snap. So now <laughs> it's like things are so much better now. Everyone is like thankful and happy and just recovering because we are like weeks into finally figuring out what the issue was. If it had been as simple as benzodiazepine withdrawal, I think he would have been better in March. Exactly. But because they yeah. stabilized him on this, it was such a low dose too. Like it's, I had nobody had any idea, including the doctors and that these kind of small amounts can trigger such terrible symptoms with people. And then I've had so many people reach out. Um, mirtazapine is the other thing. So eventually it's Suboxone and Mirtazapine. And Mirtazapine is a medication that's used to treat akathisia. There are a whole bunch of medications used to treat akathisia. All of them gave him akathisia, except for Mirtazapine. So that's been like a godsend. Jesus. Yep. What about your mom's health, Michaela? Where what's her prognosis? Good. She's get like she's not getting like you know, you after you have cancer, you have to get checked every three months and things. Yeah. Those are I think at six month points now. So she, okay. she's and, Good. and she's like she's doing really given what's happened and how traumatizing it's been, like she's doing really well. So, and my brother had a baby, like we've made it through and things are going to be really good. Um, but it was a hell of a year. I wouldn't wish this akathisia on 
anybody. And part of the reason... Do you think a, do you think a job will make a full 100% recovery? Will we be back to exactly oh, as it I was? think he'll be doing better. Like, I think it's going to take him a little bit of time. But when he's not on any medication and he's recovered from the damage it's done, yeah, he's going to be on fire. I have, I'm not concerned about that at all. He's anxious. When am I going to recover and all this stuff? But, like, this is new. It's going to take a while. But I'm, I'm absolutely certain that he's going to... Be 120 percent. Extraordinary amount of responsibility, haven't you, Michaela, in terms of making judgment. I mean, it's been you've been around the world for a whole year in very unlikely countries, but with you know with a young family. But just on an emotional level, to be the responsible for making these decisions. That must have been exhausting and a bit terrifying, wasn't it? Yeah, it was horrible. You don't have sort of medical training, so you're having to. That's a huge thing, isn't it, to take on? Yeah, I've done, because of my experience being ill, I've done a lot of research, but no, I don't have the training. I just know, like, there's this trust people have in doctors that I don't have because doctors are just people, right? They make mistakes. There are things that they don't know. I don't, I don't trust. Uh, and from the reaction I've had to medications, the doctors have said that's not possible, and I, I've had it. I know, I know it. So when I saw how hard it was on my mom and I was like there, my family had, didn't know what to do other than to leave him in the hospital for ECT. They didn't want to do that. They said no, but we don't know what to do. No to that, but we don't know what to do. We don't know where to go. Like, what are the options? And I thought, OK, I'm I'm in a pretty good place. Like I could handle this for a while. I'm completely burnt out now. Um, and it was like worse. I was hoping it would be a smoother ride. I was hoping we'd go there. It would go easily and we'd be back in six months or three months um, with dad better. But like, turns out it took a year, but at least we're here. Uh, but yeah, it was stressful. I definitely do not recommend <laughs> any of the last year. No, I can well imagine. It's an extraordinary tale, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it really, really is. I, I wrote it down like I was keeping notes because I was just like, this is absolutely absurd. Yeah, it's an amazing, amazing tale. I'm just looking briefly at my notes to see if there's anything that I meant to ask you. Um, but I think that was incredibly comprehensive. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm good. Um, okay. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And yeah. And can you ask if, after I've interviewed your father tomorrow, if there's anything else I said, anything, oh God, I should have asked you this or that, would it be okay if I drop you an email? Yeah. And pick up anything that's still, that's unanswered. Yep, for sure. We're, we're just looking, we're looking to, dad was hoping, I don't know what the article is going to be like. He's hoping it's not going to focus entirely on health. I said that I read the other stories and some of them were pretty health focused. So we'll, we'll see what he says tomorrow. Because he's trying to, you know, get past this. But we thought if people understood what happened and the reasoning yeah. behind things, then we could just let it be. <laughs> it's like, this yeah. happened. Don't yeah. do some of these things. And if you yeah. are on these medications, like especially psych meds, and you're akathisic, and you weren't before, maybe look at the meds, right? But people don't yeah. know about it. And there are some docs, some specialists out there that can help if you know what the problem is. Um but yeah, ideally, we'll just leave this be and then dad can go back to touring and writing and doing podcasts and being controversial and we can not deal with uh, health for a yeah. while. It was like my entire life. But yeah, yeah, reach out if you have any questions. Brilliant. Michaela, thank you very, very much. Hey, thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.